So my friend told me this story and swears it's true. It still sends chills down my spine every time I think about it. So it's a story of his friend, who's also a skilled hunter named Joe, a man who played guitar in local indie band, and an experienced tracker. One fateful day, Joe embarked on a solo expedition deep into the wilderness of New Mexico, unaware of that that awaited him. It started out like any other hunting trip. The crisp air of the wilderness was there. As he ventured into the heart of nature, his rifle by his side, and a sense of anticipation in his vein. He had his sights set on an elk, a creature whose meat would sustain him through the coming months. As the sun began its descent, casting long shadows across the landscape, he finally spotted the perfect target. With steady hands and focused determination, he aimed and fired, the sound of the gunshot shattering the tranquil silence of the forest. The elk fell, and he felt a mix of pride and relief. But then things started to go awry. As he approached the fallen elk, a strange sensation washed over him. It was as if a pair of eyes were piercing through the dense foliage, watching his every move. He brushed off as mere paranoia, attributing it to the isolation of the wilderness. Yet, as he reached down to claim his prize, a roar echoed through the trees, shaking him to the core. He froze, his heart pounding in his chest as he turned to face the source of the terrifying sound. What he saw defied all logic and reason. Standing before him was a massive, bipedal creature towering over like a Bigfoot. Before he could react, the creature lunged at him with lightning speed, its powerful fist connecting with his jaw. He crumpled to the ground, disoriented and in pain, as it swiftly grabbed the elk carcass, tearing it away from his grasp. The creature vanished into the wilderness, leaving him in a state of shock and disbelief. So he sat there trying to make sense of what had just happened. He says it felt like a nightmare, but the ache in high jaw and the lingering taste of blood confirmed its chilling reality. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't shake off the image of that immense creature stealing his kill. He still swears it's a true story. Do with this story what you want. Ex-Royal Navy Lieutenant here. Back in 2006, the ship I was on, HMS York was crossing the Bay of Biscay when we found a single empty survival suit floating around. When it was first spotted, we thought it was a body, but when we put a boat out to check it out, it turned out to be empty. Probably fell off a container ship in a storm or something totally normal. Or maybe something else spooky or whatever. That was kind of creepy, but not really. We bend it almost immediately. Of course, there's nothing your average sailor likes more than gossip and exaggeration. So within a matter of hours, there were rumors sweeping the lower decks that the guys who'd picked it up out of the water had found blood or body parts or bite marks or anything else someone could make up. Classic sailor rumor mongering action. A few days later, I had one of the younger and more gullible lads, 17 or 18 years old, in my division asked to speak to me in private and tell me that he was scared that he'd get eaten by a sea monster if he went overboard. Naturally, I told him we'd do our best to get him out of the water before any of the local wildlife could get a proper hold on him. Job's a good one. Round about 20 years ago, I worked for the Big Boy Scout Ranch in New Mexico. Philmont, Google it, it's gorgeous. The ranch itself is divided up into little regional support zones. You have a base camp where all these backpacking hiker scouts would come in. Ages of about 14, 20, one sometimes with their parents, but generally chaperoned in some way and oftentimes a mix of guys and girls. So these kids, and I use the word kid loosely because, hey, I'm old, and all you 20, some things are kids to me. It's not an insult, it's just perspective. Would go through an initial training period and then be set loose on the ranch. 
They'd get an itinerary telling them to be at X place at I time, and then off they'd go, knocking out their 100-plus mile course over 10 days to 3 weeks. I have to admit, it was pretty awesome as a scout. It was a grand experience, and at $350 a kid for two weeks, it was pretty cheap. So anyway, regional zones of control. Scattered throughout the ranch, there were maybe 100, 120 primitive camping sites. Some place to drop your gear, get water, take a dump, whatever. You might be on the trail for two. Three days before you got to one of the 34, 36 staffed backcountry camps. A backcountry camp had a staff of three, six, depending on the size and activity. The activity was some sort of old West-style skill that they would then teach the kids. Maybe it's gold panning or deep rock mining, shotguns, burrow racing, compass, and starlight navigation. Whatever. I worked at three separate backcountry camps during my years as staff. This would have been the summer of 90s. There were a number of bear attacks that year, more than a dozen. There were also two mountain lion attacks that thankfully the news agencies ignored. Come to think of it, I was stalked twice, each time for more than 30 minutes. I worked at Harlan Camp, a backcountry camp with guns, specifically shotguns. Full NRA certified range and donation of four gorgeous Ruger Red Label over under 12 gauge shotguns. We'd spend the mornings teaching kids to reload birdshot shells and spend the afternoons blazing away at clay pigeons. We also had burrows. Think of them as shorter, more pissed off donkeys. We'd name them and then just after dinner the kids would be assigned a burrow and flog them up and down the valley in a race. And we'd watch every time and pray that the kids wouldn't get their face kicked in. But when we weren't teaching the kids, we maintained an active search area of about 24 square miles around our little backcountry heaven. We were all search and rescue trained. Occasionally, a half-crew of bewildered campers would hit our front porch and tell us that someone had fallen and broken a leg or needed to be similarly evaxed. So, this is really just one story of many. Our camp also bordered the highway, and we often had weirdos try and hike up the jeep trail from the road. We'd have to corral these people and escort them off the ranch, once at gunpoint. Spooky tales starts here. So it's just after midnight, late part of the season, maybe the first or second weekend of September. Weather starting to change, the nights came earlier. The camp had finally quieted down, and we'd wrapped up the last bear patrol of the evening, basically running around and making sure some dumbass kid hadn't dumped powdered Gatorade on a stump again in the hopes of luring a bear to his campsite. The bulk of the campers were asleep by about 9 p.m.-ish. On these nights, there was one lone light on the staff cabin, really just bright enough for you to find your way to the shitter and back without getting lost. No moon this night, but the starlight could still be pretty incredible. Were it not so overcast, we're sitting there on the front porch. Three of us. The camp director is inside. We're cleaning the guns. I can still remember the smell of the solvent, big black glass bottle. We just slid the guns back into the safe and we were locking up when it started, screaming. Sounded like a person. Sounded like several. Women, screaming. I've never heard anything like it before or since, but distant and close all at the same time. I looked at my buddy and we both grabbed our guns and reached for the emergency loads. One shell of tightly packed power that made one hell of a noise. And one shell loaded with zero-zero buckshot that we didn't let the kids use. We booked it out to the burrow pens, only to find the burrows not there. They had a square enclosure and a sort of long run that opened up to a small fenced pasture and a hayloft about 20 feet tall. So we make it through the gate, and the screaming is much worse. Maybe two minutes have passed since we stepped off the cabin porch. I'm in the best shape of my life at this point, but still my heart was pounding so hard I could hear it. 
I could feel the blood pumping in my ears. I was so on edge. We moved back into the enclosure, spread out so as not to accidentally blow each other in half. The screaming changed, shifted from high pitch to something more guttural. More like a low, hoarse, raspy growl. Sounded huge, moving through the tree lines just outside the fence. We finally get to the burrows. They're all bunched up by the fence line. They see us and come running over. Like we're part of the herd or something. They're shaking. And in the cool, crisp air, they're sweating. Like they've been sprinting back and forth in the pen. The screaming stops. The whatever the F it was moves back into the tree. My buddy takes aim and fires his noise load. But this did not hasten the withdrawal of the creature. We'd packed the noise loads two months previous in celebration of the 4th of July. We'd hiked up to the ridge, and at midnight our guns had belted fire into the sky. The thunderous report was reported heard from the other camps up the valley, twenty miles away. Fitting since it took two days for my ears to stop ringing, the creature took its time leaving. Huge bushes shook when it made its way through them. We hung around with the burrows till dawn, took turns sleeping in the hayloft just in case. The burrows... Best to think of them like big dogs seemed overjoyed to have us there, leaping and jumping about. When the sun came up, I saw the blood, blood on the hooves of the burrows, blood in the pasture, blood on the fence, blood splattered on hay, blood on our boots and jeans, where we'd failed to see what we were standing in the night before. I followed the blood trail up the ravine wall that the fenced pasture backed up to. I didn't have to go more than twenty or thirty years before I found what was left of it. Big mountain lion, probably male. I couldn't tell. Got into the burrow pen, probably thinking he could take one down. Goddamn burrow stomped the F to death. Its rear legs were practically sheared off. Crushed pelvis and lower spine twisted and exposed. It didn't react to the noise from the shotgun, because it couldn't. It just wanted to get away from there before it died. My grandfather was on the United States S Block Island when it was sunk off the coast of Italy in 1944. Six men lost and 951 were rescued by the other ships in the fleet. When the ship was hit, obviously the evacuation was immediate. No time to grab personal effects, just grab a life vest and get the F out. Eventually, my grandfather was plucked out of the water by a Marine on another vessel. Fast forward to 1966. My grandfather was working in a hangar in the Norfolk, Virginia Naval Base. Right as he was getting ready to wrap up his work for the day, he was approached by two men in suits. They were FBI. FBI. Are you ex, Grandpa? Yes. FBI, were you on the United States S. Block Island in 1944? Yes. Were you issued a 9 millimeter pistol, serial 12,345,678? I believe so. Mitch, do you know where that pistol is right now? At the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, as far as I know. Turns out that as the ship was being evacuated and someone grabbed some weapons, or at least this particular one, out of the armory. The weapon somehow found its way to the United States and had been found at the scene of a mob murder the two weeks earlier in New York City. Edit, now that I am thinking about it, their rescue was pretty badass too and worth telling. The other ships in the fleet sailed full speed towards the floating survivors, then cut their engines to avoid detection from the U-boat's radar, I guess and their momentum allowed them to drift through the survivors and pick them up. My grandfather said he tread water for hours before finally being scooped out of the ocean. Most of the guys had life vests, but they only helped keep them afloat for a little while, and they had to share them. He said he didn't have enough strength to pull himself up onto the rescuing vessel, and that the marine that pulled him out of the water was one of the largest men he had ever seen in his life. As the block island sank, the survivors heard an explosion. They were pretty sure it was the sound of the block island exploding either as a result of the water pressure on the munitions, or maybe something in the ship was still burning and caught munitions. Or the ship's fuel supply. 
No matter the case, they were pretty sure the sound came from their sinking ship because of the direction it came from. The German sub that hit them thought the explosion was the sound of them being hit and surfaced to assess the damage. When the Germans surfaced, the rest of the fleet blew the U-boat out of the water. My friend Matt lived on the corner of South Carpenter in Sleepy Hollow, New York. His house was surrounded by woods and had well water. His neighbors owned cows, horses, and many acres of land. Matt's sister was a medium and was able to communicate with spirits. She was kind of gothic and had a strange group of friends. During one birthday party, a group of Goths came back terrified. They said they had seen a witch in the woods. At first, they saw an old lady from a distance, and it seemed like she was lost and looking for something. They approached her eager to help. They stepped closer and went to reach for her shoulder when she began laughing. She turned around and petrified the group. Most of the people thought the group was lying, but Matt knew his sister could tell the kids were serious, too. They were actually scared, and the forest they were in was a labyrinth of spooky trees. It was easy to get turned around. Later that year, this is what happened. Matt, Bill, and I were hiking during the winter months. There wasn't snow on the ground, but the air sure was cold. We were bundled up and didn't plan on going far. But of course we followed the trail and it led us to a place we could never imagine. I was following Matt, but he wasn't the best with directions. We were in a thick forest that we had never explored before. We continued trekking, searching desperately for familiar territory. It was getting dark. Finally we heard cars. We made it to the road and saw it with Sleepy Hollow. I thought it was funny and antagonized Bill and Matt about the headless horsemen, but they were a little younger than me and started to cry. They were scared. It should have been straightforward to make it back to the house using the roads. But sadly, we did not make the best decisions. Matt was oblivious to the surrounding streets and directions and was clueless about how to get us back. I remember the route my dad used very vaguely and attempted to lead us back. There were no sidewalks, so we walked on the ditch alongside the forest. After a while, Bill ran ahead of me. He said something was back there, something was following us. I didn't believe him, and I stopped walking. I looked back and saw that he wasn't lying. There was some kind of black upright dog just walking behind us. We started to jog, and so did the canine. Matt and Bill were faster than me. I told him to run ahead and that I would get this thing away from us. By that point, I had a general idea of where I was. I be landed to the forest and caught the trail. I couldn't see much, but the trees paved the way for me. I had no visual of the dog anymore, but I knew it was on my trail. After what felt like forever, I could hear the commotion from Matt's family's party. The flames from the bonfire peeked through the trees, and I felt relieved. I moved towards the tree line and suddenly went barreling into the ground. My foot caught a root, and I was badly scraped up. With my hands and knees bleeding, I rolled over in slow motion, and my life flashed before my eyes. I heard something crashing down the path about thirty yards from me. I hopped to my feet and went straight through the briars and branches leaping to the illuminating grass. I made it to the fire, and the creature luckily left the darkness. Matt and Bill were already sitting on their mom's lap, telling the story. My parents were happy to see. I was still alive, but not surprised at all. The adults saw my wounds and gasped. I told them the werewolf got me. Years later, my friend Alex moved nearby. He had two encounters with a wolfman. Once, he and his two sisters saw a large, lichen creature cross the road and scale a deep hill within seconds. His other encounter was with me. We saw a pair of eyes out of his patio window in the woods. It was the scariest night of my life, and I never slept over there again. We tried to sleep in the basement, but had to go upstairs because we were terrified. The moon hung low in the night sky as I stood outside the apartment building, my heart pounding with a mix of excitement and nervous anticipation. Today was the day I would join the ranks of the police force as a rookie officer. 
My name is Alex, and I had always dreamed of making a difference, of upholding justice in a world that seemed too often plagued by darkness. My partner for this first assignment was Detective Ryan, a seasoned veteran with a reputation for his sharp instincts and unwavering resolve. Together, we were tasked with investigating a homicide case, a daunting task for a rookie like me, but I was eager to prove myself. As we approached the apartment, a sense of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. The door was locked, a barrier between us and the truth hidden within. With a swift kick, Detective Ryan forced the door open, revealing a chilling scene that would forever be etched in my memory. There, before us, lay the lifeless body of the victim. It was a gruesome sight, a chilling reminder of the evil that lurked in the shadows. But what shocked us both was not just the presence of death, but the grotesque creature feasting on the remains. It was a dog-like creature, but larger, more akin to a wolf. Its hulking figure loomed over the body, its snarling face contorted with an unsettling mix of animalistic hunger and a twisted human-like visage. The sight sent shivers down my spine, and I felt an instinctive urge to protect and serve, to rid the world of this abomination. Reacting on pure instinct, Detective Ryan and I drew our weapons and fired at the creature, hoping to neutralize the threat it posed. But the bullet seemed to have little effect. It let out a chilling growl, launching itself at us with a speed and strength that defied logic. Caught off guard, we were tackled to the ground, our bodies hitting the floor with a resounding thud. The creature slipped away from our grasp, a blur of fur and teeth, disappearing into the night before we could regain our footing. The chaos and confusion that ensued left us breathless questioning the reality of what we had just witnessed. We exchanged bewildered glances, our faces etched with disbelief and uncertainty. Did we really see what we think we saw, or was it some hallucination brought on by exhaustion or something we inadvertently ingested? The questions lingered in the air, a heavy fog obscuring the truth. With a deep breath, Detective Ryan and I collected ourselves determined to make sense of the inexplicable. We scoured the surroundings, searching for any trace of the creature, but it was as if it had vanished into thin air, frustration mingled with disbelief, our minds struggling to comprehend the events that had unfolded. As we stood there, gazing into each other's eyes, a silent understanding passed between us. We may never fully understand what we witnessed that night, but we knew that our duty remained to protect the innocent, to uphold justice, and to face the darkness head, on, even when it defied explanation. In the end, we may never have a definitive answer to the question that haunted us. Did we truly encounter a monstrous being, or was it an illusion, a trick of the mind? My friend and I, both 18-year-old males at the time, decided to go camping in the Mogollon Rim of northern Arizona. We had no particular spot in mind as to where to camp, so we drove around the NF woods until we came across a small, very secluded lake. I literally brought everything a guy would need to be out camping in the wilderness. Sleeping bags, lighter, food, knife, etc. Except I had forgotten my brand new Coleman tent. I purchased specifically for this adventure. So we wound up just camping in our sleeping bags on the ground next to the fire. It took forever to fall asleep because the temperatures dropped below freezing and we were shaking. We went based off the weather for Payson, Arizona, which was 4,000 feet and 50 miles from where we actually laid camp. My friend, we'll call him Tom, fell asleep before I did. I can't remember if ever did fall asleep or if I was just half asleep. But around midnight, I start hearing some really weird noises in the distance. I knew there were elk bugling nearby, so I didn't think much of it. Gradually, a snapping sound kept getting closer and closer to the camp over the course of about a half hour. I started getting scared, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. Suddenly, on the side of camp closest to Tom, I hear something running through the meadow straight toward us. 
I jumped up so fast and yelled at Tom to get up. While I was yelling at him, I was searching the ground nearby for my .40 caliber handgun. By the time I got the gun and flashlight trained on Tom, there is was massive black bear standing right above him. Tom was trying to get up, having realized there was in fact a bear hovering above him. I aimed in the direction of the bear and squeezed the trigger four times. I could hear the bear run off, not knowing whether I hit it or not. We were shaking so fiercely afterwards I couldn't tell as if it was the cold or the adrenaline. We then packed our sleeping bags and left all of the other stuff to retrieve in the morning and began the half-mile walk back to the dirt road where Tom's car was. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Bear stalked us all the way back to the car. When I was a kid, I went for cross-country biking nearby to our home. There is a roughly two kilometers, 15 miles, loop of a forest path. In the forest, it is ride, able if a bit difficult at some points. After just riding a couple of minutes on a narrow forest path, I see a figure walking ahead of me. It looks like a hooded elderly lady walking really slowly. I cannot see her face or anything, just a dark hood covering her. I recall she being very tall, but I was also just 13 years old, so she could have been normal size. I drove just behind her, but the path is too narrow to overtake her from any of her sides. Also, I get this heavy feeling on my chest, telling me not to try to overtake her. I can't explain it, but something just felt very off when I got closer to her. I stop my bike and get off and watch her walk ahead of me. I then think that this is silly, and she must be startled if she turns around and sees me there. So I think to act cool and turn down to pick up a blueberry. I pick it up, raise my head back to the road ahead of me, and there is nothing. I can see the path ahead maybe 50 meters and it's just impossible that she would have never done that distance within those five seconds. I wasn't watching. I then try to reason this with and think that she must have jumped off road since there is extremely thick bushes and I cannot see there. I felt a bit uneasy about this but decide to continue. I ride my bike about 500 meters more and there is a cliff where I can see down the road ahead another 500 meters and there she is I can see her walking there again really slowly again tall figure covered in a dark hood I cannot see her face or anything but the hood she is wearing and she is walking slowly on the road I really couldn't figure out how she made it there in such a short time since even I couldn't do the distance in that time even with my bike I'm extremely alarmed at this point, but decide to continue. I drive the hill down and to the spot where I saw her before. Again, there is nothing. At this part of the forest, it is more open than I can see quite far in any direction. Yet she is nowhere to be seen, and yet there she was just 30 seconds before. I continue my trip and finally finish my first loop of the trail and decide to go yet another round. After going for a couple of minutes, there she is, exactly the same spot I saw her at the first time, again, tall, dark hooded, walking slowly. I got totally freaked out after this. I rode off the woods as fast as I could and in a total panic ride to my friend's home, which was further away from the woods than my own home. Until today, I have no idea what I saw and it gives me the chills when I remember her figure. The arctic tundra stretched out before me, vast and unyielding. I, an Inuit hunter born and raised in this unforgiving ice wilderness, had set out on a crisp, frigid morning to fish in the frozen waters. The landscape was a stark beauty with pristine snow-covered expanses as far as the eye could see. As I trudged through the snow, I couldn't help but feel a sense of connection to the land. My ancestors had thrived in these harsh conditions for centuries, and I was determined to honor their legacy. However, as the sun dipped low on the horizon, I noticed a foreboding haze in the distance. My heart sank as I realized it was coming from the direction of our small Inuit village. 
panic surged through me, and I raced back as quickly as I could, my boots crunching through the snow with each hurried step. Arriving at the village, I was met with a scene of chaos and devastation. The humble homes of my fellow villagers had been torn apart, their belongings scattered like flotsam in the icy sea. I knew this was no ordinary predator. It was something unknown, something monstrous. Determined to uncover the truth, I set out on a reconnaissance mission, venturing towards the outskirts of the village where the creature had vanished. The biting cold gnawed at me, but I pressed on. It was then that I spotted them, massive yeti-like creatures. These formidable beings were unlike anything I had ever seen, towering in white. They had hulking forms with fur-covered bodies that resembled a bear on steroids. Their eyes glowed a piercing yellow, and their powerful legs allowed them to move with an unnatural grace. They were undeniably dangerous, but my curiosity got the better of me. I inched closer, trying to get a better look, but I had underestimated their sharp senses. With a sudden chilling awareness, they turned toward me. Panic gripped me as I saw the wrath in their eyes, and I knew they had noticed me. Without hesitation, the creatures bolted towards the icy forest, disappearing among the snow-laden trees. The sheer size and speed at which they moved left me in awe. However, I also realized that if I pursued them further, I would be risking my life. Reluctantly, I made the difficult decision to abandon my pursuit. The creatures were far too formidable, and I was just a lone Inuit hunter. I couldn't stand a chance against these enigmatic giants. I retraced my steps back to the village, my thoughts racing. It was clear that I needed to inform the authorities about what I had witnessed. I reached for my satellite phone and dialed the local police, my voice trembling as I recounted the incredible encounter with these unknown predators. The response on the other end was skeptical, to say the least. The police were incredulous, questioning the validity of my story. They suggested it might have been a bear, despite my insistence that these creatures were unlike anything I had ever seen before. I was RV camping with my Irish wolfhound, Marty, last summer. We were in an old camping ground outside of Naples, Florida. Marty wanted out around 10 p.m. that night. Not long after I let him out, I heard a loud yelping from the swamp. I immediately flooded the area with my handheld spotlight, calling out to Marty. That's when I saw an unusual creature, with eyes that glowed brilliant orange. The creature was yellowish-brown, two half feet tall, bipedal with several foot-long spines on the back. It was hunched over Marty, sucking blood. Out of, of his neck, it screeched at me and ran off. Marty's neck had two fang marks as he laid lifeless. I heard another scream nearby, so I picked up Marty's body and headed home to the 24-hour vet. The vet said he had never seen this before and confirmed that Marty had been drained of blood. He mentioned El Chupacabras from his home in Puerto Rico, but said he had never seen one and thought his was a myth. I am 26 years old and have worked on a sea scallop boat since I have been 18 years old. During the course of my time on the water, this question brought two stories to my attention. These are not in order of importance, and I apologize for any grammar mistakes in the future. First story happened a couple years ago when we were working off the coast of Long Island, I believe. It was a little rough, but nothing out of the ordinary. It was dark and about three in the morning, and everything was going smooth. On a scallop boat, you are required to shuck and do other things in between towels that happen every hour. It's basically a floating factory. I was in a shack back in the stern of the vessel, standing in the back that can be closed up while you shuck. All of a sudden the wind starts to pick up and the lightning starts closer. Then you won't when you're the tallest object. It's roaring and raining so hard that the rain was hitting me in the back of the shack. The boat starts listing to port and it sounds more violent than you can imagine. The door was tied off so I rushed to shut the door and use all my strength to shut it. 
I am by myself in here, and I've been never so scared when the boat started, listing over even harder. This lasted for about ten minutes. Then it was over. Looked outside, and all the gear was everywhere, in a bucket that was deep inside a tote. Up in the front of the deck was taken out it and laying on deck. The position and protection where this was only led my other co-workers and I on watch to believe we indeed were just hit by a water spout. The second story was when the boat was fishing offshore sometime during March. It was shitty and cold out and you could barely stand up. We were fishing with our starboard facing the waves because we were on a tow in producing. As time goes by, it's going to sound weird, but you develop an intuition of when you're going to get hit by a wave when picking up scallops on deck. When working in the pile, you try to keep your scuppers closed, it's rough, because you don't want to make it harder on yourself or get your gloves wet. It all becomes very instinctual, so this night it starts to get rougher progressively. Another guy and myself are working on the starboard side and doing fine. He was back aft and I was forward. I was directly next to the hatch for the fish hold. We're picking then, we feel this wave coming. Like I said earlier, you can tell the power somehow and guess what you're going to do. This is the east coast, so the continental shelf drop-off isn't that substantial as the west. So typically ruse waves are few and far between. So my co-worker and I don't even try to duck or cover in anticipation. I just lift my gloves a little and assume this will be nothing special. Then the rest of it comes. We didn't have a chance. The power was forceful and slammed myself against the hatch. Thankfully, because or else, I think I would have been washed over the port side in full gear. The other guy was washed into the other rail, and by the time I got up, I could see the fear in his eyes of what just happened to him. I was more confused due to the impact of the violent wave and the cold water. Got changed and worked for another couple hours before my watch was over. That was a shit night. My name is Don Montgomery, Jr. My father was stationed at RAF Bentwaters from 1977 to 1982. At the time of this event, we were living in Suffolk on the Black's Farm, near Rendlesham Forest. This house is huge. We had some very interesting events happen in the home. Once we moved in, my brother started talking to an invisible friend, and he had full, on conversations. Shortly after that, I started hearing noises coming down the driveway, which used to be a cobbled way. Their hooves beating on stones, but no horses were there. Then an old lady in white dress and bonnet would walk across the walled yard. Then an elderly man in a wheelchair would wheel himself down the hall and up the stairs, which could only be accessed by a staircase. Our room was upstairs, and our room looked out over the walled-in yard. The home had entirely too many rooms for us to heat, so we would frequently close off a lot of the main rooms and just heat the main area. I had tried telling my parents that I had been seeing people that were not there, and they thought I was making this up. We were all sitting in the living room watching something on the television when something pushed down the mechanism to push down the heavy oak door. With a very loud thump, the door opened then closed. My family were flabbergasted as we all heard walking through the living room. Then the other door on the other side of the room, the one that led to the stairs, was opened and then shut. My parents looked at each and then looked at me. Me being 16 at the time, I looked at them and I said, Told you. I never saw my brother's friend, but I knew he had to exist. The whole time we lived there, we always constantly had something happening in the paranormal. It was later in 1981 that I found a picture of the man in the wheelchair in a class photo in an old garage. I showed it to my parents and I told them, This is the man that I had been seeing. He was considerably younger but I will never forget that face. I still see spirits to this day. They have become a part of my life, and I have learned to accept it. Now, Rendlesham Forest, December 23, 1980. I was sitting on the back porch of the Black's farm. It was dark and cold. I was cleaning rabbits on the back porch that my father had shot. 
I was finishing up with a rabbit when a white ball of light coming from the south of the house moved north to the back field behind the house. It is completely silent. I watched it with awe, not quite believing what I was seeing. It hovered over the far field and looked to be about the size of a mini cooper. It cast a glow on the wet mud in the field and then seemed to land in the field. It was simply beautiful. It looked like it was pulsing. I eventually snapped out of it. I went to get my dad. I was very excited. When we came back out, it was gone. Like it had blinked out of existence. My father did not think I saw what I knew I had seen. He told me it was probably a helicopter and not a big deal. I knew what I had seen. The next day, I walked out to where I thought it landed. I went back to my house, got my dad, and told him he needed to come out and see what I found. We got out there, and there were three circular impressions there on the ground equally spaced out, and my original set of footprints going to and from the site. Very muddy, and then our prints going back to the site, where the orb had landed. My father was surprised enough that he called the base and reported what he had found and I had seen. No one ever came to my knowledge to check the site. Then a couple of days later, the famous Rendlesham Forest event occurred at RAF Bentwater's Woodbridge. So as a kid, I lived about 100 miles away from the nearest town at a house without electricity running water, the works in the Colorado Rockies. This place was in the bum of middle of nowhere, and we frequently did see all sorts of wild animals. Elk, deer, coyotes, and such. Our property and a bunch of other neighbors' property bordered National Forest Roads, so to keep people off of our road, we had a gate about a mile and a half from our house that we drove through before we were home. This time of year, we are the only people up there. All the other homes are hunting cabins long empty by this late in the winter. Now, this was not the type of gate that you could drive around if you forgot your key. There were tons of trees all around it with barbed wire and ditches and such, so anyone wanting for off-road around it would have to basically build a new road around this gate. Well, one night my mom, brother, sister and I pull up to the gate and we cannot find the key. It's gone. So one of us has to hike to the house to get a spare, then walk back. Now it's recently snowed in January, and it is totally dark. Like can't see your hand in front of your face dark, and with the new snow you can't hear anything too. There are a few clouds in the sky on and off to let some starlight through every once in a while, but it's dark and of course there isn't a flashlight either. So off I go. First you walk through about 200 meters of trees, then it opens up into a huge meadow, which then narrows back down again to trees for another 200 meters, then opens up again into another huge meadow, which on the other side of is our house. So I set out and everything seems fine. I'm just irritated that I have to do this. I'm like 15, 16 years old at this time and a little angsty teen that is peeved at an oldest kid chore totally not thinking about my surroundings, but then I got that feeling of being watched as soon as I'm halfway through the first meadow. That deep, creepy dread that something is right behind you that you can't see, which was made a thousand times worse by the light and lack of being able to hear. My instinct was run, but I knew that if there was something that was just going to provoke it, so I kept going and then stopped to try and listen and I heard a crunch crunch just out of sight echo my footsteps. Holy shit, I was freaking the fout. This time I walk a little faster and I know there is something behind me and it's probably a cat. So I just keep walking right into the second bunch of trees before it opens up into the meadow our house is in and I can feel the pressure. At that point, we were mind milded predator and prey and I could feel the breath on my shoes. So, second clearing comes up and I know what the plan is and I book it. Thankfully, I'm familiar with what to do and I scream Mother F at the top of my lungs and I hear our dogs bark at the other side of the meadow and I know they know what's up. I stop and get big with my coat and I can hear it. 
but still not see it, just outside my vision. And I hear the dogs hauling ass towards me. When they get there, they continue right past me into the woods. I will ass to the house, got the key and the 12 gauge, and got in the 2955 tractor we used for work to head back to the gate. On my way back, I saw the tracks. It had cut right across the first part of the meadow and was on me. From what I could guess, that pit of my stomach feeling hit right when it started across the meadow. Thankfully, I got back to the gate and let the rest of my family in and told them the whole story. And while that's happening, both the dogs show up, unhurt but obviously in the same state as me. Not ready for a calm night of sleep. To this day, I never go out into the woods without a weapon. My first name is Debbie. I'm not in a position where my full name can be revealed. I wish that wasn't the case. My encounter is brief, but it has stuck with me since. In 1990, Seven, my husband, and I were in the Peace Corps, volunteering to do some good in the world. We were posted in Nepal in Dalpa, one of the most remote northern areas high in the Himalayan mountains, around 10 to 12,000 feet above sea level. Dalpa borders Tibet. The area was closed to tourists at the time. It is very remote, but since we were Peace Corps and stationed there, we were permitted to hike or track to rural towns to do our job. We lived mostly with Buddhist people. They were honest, hard-working, wonderful, and peaceful people. We had been on a track to conduct services to local community health care workers in very remote villages. I'm a pediatric nurse, so I would teach safe birthing techniques and care for infants and children, especially for burns, diarrhea, gastroenteritis, and dehydration. We trek for two weeks at a time, sometimes hiking above 14 to 15, thousand feet above the tree line. It's very remote. The nearest village will be a day's hike in between and the occasional tea house or lodge every two to three hours along the trail would follow the Glacier River with the occasional bridge to cross. The bridges often were just two large trees spanning the raging river or sometimes a suspended wood platform bridge. One time on our way back from a long two-week trek, we were hiking home and we were still about two to three days out from Dene, our home village. Our backpacks weighed about 25 to 30 pounds, so they're packed tightly. This was the era before cell phones. Not that it would matter because even today I doubt there is. Internet WIFI service since it's so remote. But we had a regular camera that I'd packed deep into my backpack. My husband was in front of me on the trail. We'd been hiking for several hours following the Glacier River and to my right was the steep gorge down the mountain leading to the river. To my left is the steep mountainside traversed up very steep, so steep one would have a very difficult time climbing hiking it. So we're trekking along our thoughts to our own, when all of a sudden I felt my hair stand on the back of my neck and my ears started ringing. It got deathly quiet. I looked ahead and I saw my husband still walking ahead on the trail. I stopped, looked down, and right on the dirt trail was a very large footprint that traversed the entire trail, maybe 18 to 20 inches long, much longer than a hiking boot. I could easily make out the toes with the big toe at a flat foot bottom and very wide heel. I thought, wow, someone has gigantic feet and is flat footed. But why would someone be out here in bare feet? Even Nepalese wore footwear when trekking, typically flip flops actually. Then I just froze and my heart started pounding in my chest. I knew it was there staring at me to my left. I could feel it. I sense it right next to me in the bush, maybe a few feet away on my left on the mountainside staring at me out of my peripheral vision. I had a human-like face and its eyes staring at me. I never felt so much fear in my life. I didn't make out its body because it was standing behind a tree peering off to the side. I knew if I didn't yell for my husband to come and see the footprint, he would never believe me. I wasn't about to put my backpack down to bring up my camera. I was too scared and had this sense of run now. Then in my mind I heard it say, Just keep going. I will not hurt you, but keep going. 
Do not look at me. I said back in my mind, I just want to show my husband the footprint and then we will go. So I tried to yell. My voice froze. I cannot make a sound. It was so strange and I'm a talker. I barely got my voice to whisper to my husband to come back. Of course he didn't hear me, so I kept trying to yell, but I just couldn't. My husband happened to look back because I think he sensed I wasn't behind him anymore, and he started backtracking towards me. I still could barely talk and sense the Yeti to my left, this whole time watching me quietly. I didn't feel like it would hurt me, but nonetheless, I was petrified. When my husband reached me, I pointed down on the path and showed him the footprint. He stared at it. Then he stared at me wide-eyed and started to look toward the Yeti, and I said, Stop! We gotta go now! My husband nodded, and we sprinted down the trail. We ran for about thirty minutes until we felt that weird feeling leave us. I felt petrified the whole time and didn't stop trying to sprint, even with our heavy packs, until we felt normal again. When we finally stopped, I told my husband what I encountered, the voice and the glimpse of its face, eyes, and that the Yeti had spoken to me in my head. I never heard of man speak until later, and then it made sense. We both were so shaken, but I'm glad he saw the footprint, or I don't think he would have fully believed me. When we arrived in the next town to stay overnight, we asked the locals if they'd ever seen the Yeti, and oh wow, did the stories fly. They told us the Yeti live in the mountain and to never hike alone, and that if we didn't bother, it would not bother us. But once in a while, the Yeti would come into town and take small livestock chickens and goats, or other crops, mostly potatoes. They told us they tried to live peacefully with the Yeti, but not to anger it, or the Yeti would seek revenge. Children were not allowed to go in the mountains alone. Since that time, and living on the United States East Coast, mostly in Pennsylvania and Maryland, I'm not have any encounters. We hiked the Appalachian Trail frequently, but honestly, that's fine with me. I've heard whistling sounds late at night. I've encountered bluish orbs, too, but that is another story for another time. I wanted to share my Yeti story finally. So I'm not a skeptic or anything. I just haven't dealt with much paranormal related stuff because I steered clear of anything that could potentially haunt me. So no dolls, mirrors, paintings, etc. About a year ago, when I was staying up late sometimes, I would hear this extremely loud breathing or at least some sort of airy movement that went on for 30 seconds whilst I just listened. It sounded the same and just as clear, even if I was in different locations for each separate occurrence. Once in the bedroom, once in the living room, and once in the home office. On the second floor, it happened in several month intervals and it sounded consistent or mechanical perhaps. Enough that I figured there must be some sort of normal explanation. The house is very new. 2010's no basement, no dark past or anything. What could explain that? Thank you. Two friends and I went hiking in the Tortolita Mountains when I was about 15. We hiked back in there for a full day. I'm not sure how much ground we covered, but it was a good amount. We set up camp for the night, cooked some grub, then I went to sleep in the tent. My buddy woke me up at around 2.30 a.m. asking me if I could hear that noise. I sat there for a moment when I heard it. it. sounded like a mouth harp off in the distance, playing a tune. Then it stopped for a bit and started up closer to us for ten or so minutes. Then stopped, relocated again, and started up. This went on for about an hour. Every ten or fifteen minutes we could hear the sound coming from a different location. We were terrified. We had no weapons. I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. In the morning, we went looking for evidence of someone being out there, and we found some footprints. I don't know how old they were, but there were some there. One hundred percent, not a Sasquatch. We are talking boot prints. The hike back was so creepy. Felt like we were being watched the entire time.
Not sure if that feeling was because we were actually being watched or if I was just sketched out from the night before, but it was one of the creepiest experiences I have ever had. Who even knows how to play a mouth harp? A friend of mine has encouraged me to share my experience from May 2021. Iron Pot Creek Campground in Toonambar National Park, west of Kyogle, New South Wales, Australia is where it happened. I and two friends were camped there for a week, and one evening we heard a squawking, screaming sound. We turned our flashlights on a black opossum being chased by a creature that was maybe four feet tall. We watched as the creature scurried up a gum tree only a few meters away. As we followed its climb, it hopped from one tree trunk to the next tree some three meters away, apparently defying physics. As it hopped out away from the tree trunk and then moved in towards the second tree that was perpendicular to each other. One of my friends watched all of this with me and we had a lively discussion about its odd attributes, but didn't think much of it. That night I awoke in my van to a juvenile one, only a foot tall with very long arms and a red face that had a pointed nose, almost like a chicken's beak. I was calm enough. I turned the light on thinking it would be scared away, but I essentially needed to push it out of the van as its curiosity was strong and fear non-existent. I slammed the door and the poor thing got its foot caught momentarily but escaped. It took a few months of processing before I really could accept the fact these creatures are not something documented and are commonly known as hairy men. There was no strong smell, but a notable distortion of time. The one weak time passed with ease, and the days were so calm. I've had time to accept what I saw, and over the past few months have shared this story recently with a friend who had his own experience in the Daintree National Park. Queensland, and encouraged me to share. I just came here today about 20 minutes ago and have seen two videos about the sounds. One I do believe is faked in all honesty. One sounds like a concert in the distance. But this isn't really about the recent happenings. What I want to know is if anyone else has ever experienced this sound before. And if so, how old are you now, or how old were you then, when you first heard it? I've read only certain people can hear it. I think above age 25, or actually 40 and above. Myself, I'm early 30s, and I have heard this sound at least twice in my life. The first time was about 12 years ago. I saw something really effing scary on someone one time. It looked like a weird smile. And because he was a friend who I trusted, I felt some super deep sense of betrayal. Like he was betraying all humans because he wasn't one. Like a demon. Yeah, I know. Crazy. But when I saw him smile that way, I heard such a sharp sound. Sounded like a trumpet, but like it was a string instrument that someone slid their fingers across really quickly and aggressively, then abruptly stopped. I used to hear this swing said all the time, for years, but when I looked for it, I couldn't find it. Then I never heard it again. In the area where I heard it, the people all still lived there. No swing set. In about a year or year and a half ago, at a different app building, I heard this loud rumbling. Didn't sound like a trumpet or anything. Just sounded like, I don't know. Deep underground construction but there was none, and it had come in waves each day I heard it. It'd last like 40 minutes, and there'd be like seven or so waves. It'd crescendo, then descends in a slow ass way, then it'd come back. Because of that, I googled the hum and looked up some vids about it. One vid tried to debunk it by saying it sounds like dry ice on a sheet of steel, which does. But it's super loud, just a low bass rumble. And one dude said it's 18 wheelers slamming on their brakes. Where I live, no big trucks would really come through like that. Maybe like three a day. I can hear the traffic from where I live. I rarely heard big trucks come through. At least not slamming on the brakes. 
After I watched that video for about a week, I'd hear like at least 15 a day. Then after that week, it all stopped. No more big tricks slamming the brakes. And I noticed it then and there and have paid attention to it since. Rarely do they slam on their brakes. And 15 trucks doing that every day for a week is very noticeable. Strange. And another thing I want to mention is how my smaller city didn't have too many police chases. But in the last three months, I hear them like at least three or four times a week. And a neighbor is a cop, and I asked if those are actually police chases, and not just cops rushing to a crime scene. And he confirmed there's police chases happening. And I've lived in this building for a second time now, for at least two years, and some odd months. And another thing I want to mention is locusts. They've been appearing every year for about two months at a time right before hurricane season. For about six years. Maybe seven. Again, I will mention that though I do believe in a supreme being, I'm not religious. I was raised Christian, sure, but I'm not a religious person. Not anymore. And the reason I say this is because I've noticed the religious concepts in this I'm writing right now. Anyway, what do y'all think? Have y'all noticed this stuff? And what do you think of it? Just a coincidence and I'm being superstitious. I swear that what I'm about to tell you is true and I must clarify that I did work in a secretive government program. Under the Obama administration, we were tasked with analyzing cryptids those mysterious and often elusive creatures like Bigfoot and Dogman. Our program operated far from the public eye, hidden away in the shadows, and most of our work was classified. One day, while deep in the heart of our research, we received a startling piece of information that had everyone in the office buzzing. Something huge was being captured at a local national park, and the government wanted us to investigate. The urgency was palpable, and it felt as if we were about to be given a unique opportunity to uncover the truth behind these enigmatic beings. I was part of a small team, and we arrived at the National Park just as the sun was beginning to set. The air was thick with anticipation, and our hearts raced as we ventured deeper into the wilderness. Armed with equipment for data collection and recording, we had no idea what we were about to witness. As we journeyed into the park, the sense of urgency became overwhelming. I couldn't help but feel a strange mixture of excitement and trepidation. We followed the distant sounds of vehicles and people, which led us to a clearing bathed in the dimming twilight. There it was, a creature beyond belief sprawled on the ground. My heart pounded in my chest as I gazed at the enormous being that lay motionless before us. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. This creature was colossal with matted fur and a frame that seemed almost inhuman. Its eyes were open, but there was no life left in them. The sheer size of it was astonishing, and I couldn't believe we were finally face to face with something so extraordinary. The scene was surreal, but what shocked me even more were the people surrounding the creature dressed in what appeared to be police uniforms. They were pulling a massive cadaver-like bag, presumably meant to contain the colossal creature. It was a surreal and unsettling sight, and it made me wonder just how long the government had known about these cryptids and what their intentions were. I decided to take a risk and document the scene. I stealthily reached for my camera, lifted it towards the extraordinary sight before me, and pressed the shutter. The flash of the camera illuminated the area for just an instant, but that was long enough for one of the individuals in police attire to spot me. Fear clenched at my chest, and my heart raced as the realization hit me that I had been seen. I knew that I needed to escape, or the consequences could be dire. In a blind panic, I turned and fled, leaving behind my colleagues my work and the secrets we had spent years unearthing. I never returned to my government job. The fear of what I'd stumbled upon that day haunted me. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were just scratching the surface of something far larger and more enigmatic than I had ever imagined. The government's involvement, the creatures we were investigating, and the secrets they held were too much for me to bear. 
My life took a different path after that day, but I knew one thing for sure. Something truly extraordinary existed in our world, something that was kept hidden for reasons unknown. The images I captured remain a secret, bury away, just like the cryptids we studied. Has anyone encountered granola like people? I am a 20-year-old male, and for years I've witnessed two granola-textured people. My first encounter was at the age of five when I lived in my home in Kansas. They were about three feet two inches tall with yellow eyes and skin that was textured like granola. I would wake up in the middle of the night to see these two things staring back at me. I would often just close my eyes really hard or turn the other way. The countless times I'd tell my parents they'd brush it off as a kid just being a kid, understandable. Although one day, when I woke up after them being there the previous night, there were two sets of tiny handprints on my bedside. They weren't human handprints, but more of two sets of where someone put their fingerless hand. The handprints were made up of a disgusting-smelling granola-textured substance. My parents, baffled by it, brushed it off as me having a midnight snack. These encounters happened the entire three years I lived in Kansas. Now, I've lived in several other states where I continued to encounter these things. Now I understand as a child we are impressionable to certain things, but I know I physically saw these things and continued to see them well into my teen years. I have encounters in the other states I've lived, but this post would be an essay. Has anyone encountered anything similar? I have yet to find a similar case to this and would be interested to hear from the community. Around 15 years ago, I was in the Swiss Alps snowboarding. At night, I went outside to smoke a cigarette and heard a strange howling sound. I thought nothing at that time and went inside again to the cozy fire, a beer and a book. An hour later I went outside again to smoke and there was still the strange howling. What animal does such strange noises, I thought. But not minding, I went inside again to fire beer and book. Around midnight I went for my good night, smoke. Scanning the mountainside while listening to the howling that was still going on, I saw a small black dot in the white landscape which I thought wasn't there before, and it was also in the general direction of the sound. By now I was bursting with curiosity, so I took my gear and went outside. After an hour navigating through the hilly mountainside, I was near the source of the howling, and I could see the black dot in a snowfield some hundred meters down the hill. I must have bypassed it while orientating by sound. From how big it was in the distance, I thought it could be a fox or maybe a small lynx. Careful, I got nearer. When I was some twenty meters away, I shockingly discovered that it was a little boy crying or screaming or howling. He wasn't dressed for a winter night either. When I talked to him, he told me that he ran away from home because his mean sister destroyed his favorite toy. In the end, I had to carry him home because he couldn't feel his feet anymore. They were making holy days in a secluded house in the mountains. Since there was light in the house and smoke out of the chimney, I let him walk the last ten meters to his house alone and waited till he was inside. When I was younger, my dad, his friend, or his friend's family, my brother and I used to go on holidays to the outback. Now we live in Australia, so the outback is quite vast and secluded. One time we were camping somewhere near the Simpson Desert in the middle of absolutely nowhere. No towns for almost 1,000 kilometers, and all we slept in were swags like canvas tents in the shape of a sleeping bag. But you have a sleeping bag inside and a thin mattress on the bottom. So basically, the only thing separating your face from the outside world is a little bit of fly netting. On this particular night, we heard a lot of strange, creepy sounds during the night. And while I was sleeping, fortunately, or I would have freaked out, 
Dad watched warily as a dingo stood right beside me, staring at my face, deciding whether or not to attack me. Dad said he was poised to defend me if the dingo attacked, but fortunately, we left some food out, so instead of eating me, the dingoes ate the leftover food. It was pretty darn creepy, knowing that if they hadn't found food, they would have likely attacked us, and me in particular. First of all, let me clarify that this is happening at my brother's house, not mine. The house has been around a little over a hundred years. My grandparents lived there for at least 50 years. My brother and his wife bought the house when they sold it. Every time I was over there as a kid, I felt like I was being watched. The upstairs was the worst, especially the room next to the stairs. You just feel like you're not alone. Here's what they've told me. Pretty much every single night they hear footsteps all throughout the house. If they ask whatever it is to stop, it stops immediately. One day my sister-in-law, his wife, was home alone and heard my brother's voice coming from the baby monitor on the first floor. The other two monitors were on the second floor in my niece and nephew's bedrooms. It sounded exactly like him, but she called and made sure he was at work, not at the house. One night my nephew woke up around 3 a.m. to see what he described as a dark shape of a little boy looking into his bedroom. He said the boy started running down the hall to the room by the stairs, but when my nephew went in there, he was gone. He drew a picture of this little boy, but my nephew was six when it happened. He's eight now, so it was just a stick figure. The land itself used to be part of a property of a very old house up the road. I'm pretty sure they owned slaves back in the day. My first thought was maybe it's the ghost of a slave who was buried on the property. But that doesn't explain the voices right. Can ghosts mimic the living, or is this something else? What do you guys think? So two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk listening to music decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse-looking thing sprint out of this forest into a field, and they said it was running really fast, like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp was lean but muscular, and was completely pale or gray and naked. They both sprinted home and FaceTimed each other. When they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day, I was in disbelief, so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people, along with some others, and went looking for it. We heard the noises they described, and me and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot-looking creature walk in front of someone's barn, light like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. We continued to do this for a few nights, and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone. They go looking for it, and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like 20 feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it like six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking, we all saw it, and it was super tall, like eight, ten feet, super fast, and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long, greasy locks or strands of hair about shoulder length. Looked like a mix between a crawler, Aaron Jagger Titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. And when it was on pavement, you could hear clopping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late-night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning, and on our way back, we saw something run or hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe five feet tall, but I could see it being maybe seven feet if it was standing fully upright. Does anybody have an idea of what this massive thing could be? This was in rural northeast Ohio. Edit was reading this over and forgot to add. 
We were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights, and behind somebody's house, we heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. Couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. I did my undergrad at this tiny little college in the middle of a mountain range. Literally miles and miles of woods on every side. I think about 100 acres was technically the school's property, but except for the weird high security facility a few miles to the east, none of the neighbors cared if kids went hiking onto their property as long as they weren't destructive and wore bright colors during hunting season, had a kid. The year above me get a calf full of birdshot after running into their property with a turkey call. Anyways, the point is, there is or was a lot of woods and a lot of trail markers. Mine, now X, still very violent or nutty. Fiance was in a grad program in the city, so we were living apart. I was planning on going on a quick two-mile walk through the woods on a well-marked trail just to see the lake, the stress from midterms, etc., Relationship was extremely rocky at this point, and I get a phone call right before I start the trail. What it was about doesn't matter. The important part was that it was essentially a napalm bomb to the heart and my trust in humanity. Not trying to be dramatic, I was just a sensitive kid. So I took off sprinting down the trailhead, tears running down my face. Figured I'd take a slightly different trail that goes up a steep incline and maybe just burn myself out. It works, kind of. I'm catching my breath, and still sobbing, and I hear a group of people on the trail headed towards me. Not wanting to be known as the crying girl in the woods and not entirely in my right mind, I took off running in a random direction, passing a lot of the tree houses and forts that people make in the woods, telling myself I know where I am and that I hike these woods often and can find my way back to either the trail entrance or to the road. I jumped two creeks, which in hindsight should have stopped me because that meant I was straying way off campus. But I kept going, slipping on branches and then picking a new direction to run in. I was a dumb kid. I was a really dumb kid. There were a couple turkey vultures following me, which wasn't too surprising. Kids left food out pretty often, so they tended to be watchful. On long hikes by myself, I'd often sing to them when they tagged along. I started getting tired and slowed down to a walk, heading towards a small clearing with some toppled birch trees to sit on. My face was all messed up, and my hair had little sticks and leaves in it, but I wasn't crying anymore. I lit a cigarette and stared at the ground and felt pretty damn sorry for myself. At some point, I stopped feeling pretty damn sorry for myself and started feeling jumpy, kind of tingly, and everything I saw had this new level of sharpness and clarity to it. It wasn't really a feeling that I was being watched, more like I was somewhere I really, really didn't belong. It was starting to get dark. I had no cell service. The only thing I had on me besides my phone was a lighter pack of cigarettes and small pocket knife, shorts, tea shirt, light windbreaker. I was literally search and rescue's worst nightmare. Trying to calm myself down, I tried to find any trail markers. None. Didn't recognize anything around me, couldn't hear any running water, and was too turned around to know where the road was. It was getting pretty chilly, and the woods were starting to make that sound that I can only describe as teeming. I didn't want to wander in a random direction, but the feeling of dread kept getting stronger and stronger, so I slowing started walking. Started hearing things, mostly whispers which I figured I was hallucinating due to dehydration or exhaustion. And then the shadows. It was the strangest thing, these tall, thin shadows being cast on the trees. I would have chalked it up to the sunset. But the movement of them was unnatural, and I kept catching them in the corner of my eye. They kind of swayed, or kind of jumped. It was a strange juxtaposition between how thoroughly creeped out I was and how pretty the sunset was that night. I remember looking at the sky, trying to calm myself down and pick a direction that felt right. But no direction felt right. 
I kept getting turned around, heard a few distinctive twig snaps in the distance. A wicked chill ran down my spine, and at this point I wasn't thinking eldritch forest elves. I was thinking bobcat or black bear. Started sniffling and crying silently again because I knew I had messed up. I was fifty shades of paranoid dehydrated, and I pray to God hallucinating. And then I heard a rustle of wings that just about scared the shit out of me, and I looked up, and there was the vulture, just looking at me. I was so out of it that I think I asked it for help. It stared at me for a few more seconds and then took off. It landed on a branch a few meters away and stared at me doing the angry feather fluff thing that they do. Walked up to the tree it was perched in, and it took off again and landed on another branch a ways away. So I did what any sane person would do in that situation, and followed the vulture. The feeling of dread slowly wore away, and I started feeling okay. It was such a polite vulture waiting for me to catch up and then flying off again. I don't remember how long I followed it, just that it was a while, and even when it was getting really twilight. Dusky out, I still felt safe. I started recognizing landmarks, glacial boulders, the tree forts and could hear voices up ahead. The vulture lead me a few more meters right onto the main trail and then stayed put. I thanked it, apologized, and made my way towards the group of people camped out. I knew a bunch of the kids. They freaked out. I was promptly handed hot tea and french fries. They asked how the hell I made my way out there, and I just shrugged. I didn't feel like sharing about the vulture, and when I tried to spot him again, he'd flown off. Here's the real scary part of the story, though. No one realized I was gone. I lived alone, and my friends had assumed that I wasn't answering texts because I was studying. It was also a Friday, meaning that no one would have even thought it strange I was gone, as I often left to the city without telling anyone for the weekend. Essentially, no one would have even started looking until Monday, at which point I might have been either bobcat food or a sacrifice to the deer god. So thank you, my kind vulture friend. Vultures are hands down my favorite animals now. I recently received a telephone call from a friend of an eyewitness who was born and raised in a northwest suburb of Chicago, Illinois. The only specific location reference was given as near the Dees Plains River. The eyewitness D discussed multiple sightings from 1978 through 1988 while he lived there as a boy. The sightings would usually occur at dusk and would continue throughout the night, and there were at least two winged creatures always seen flying in a wide circle at an altitude of 500-600 feet. The creatures were silhouetted against the clouds that were backlit by the city lights. The description of these creatures was that there was no head or neck that could be seen. They had long, thick tails, but no legs or feet were visible. The huge wings had no feathers, but were membranes similar to that of a dragon or proterosaur. Apparently, the neighborhood residents were well aware of the nightly sightings. When I was 18, my then boyfriend and I were outside and we heard footsteps, so we got scared and ran inside. When we finally worked up the nerve to go back out so he could leave, I reached for the doorknob and the doorknob started shaking and there was a simultaneous loud knocking on the door. We started screaming, of course, and went and woke up my father who went outside with a gun and nothing was there. My father has lived there for 60 years and isn't one that believes in paranormal anything. He makes comments about the noises and had someone tear down the crosses and the fence after I told him about what I had learned. He would never admit it, but I'm sure he's probably seen things too. This incident occurred in 2004. I was working as a park ranger at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in north central Ohio. I knew nothing about Ohio since I had grown up on the west coast. I had actually volunteered for the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift when it was available. I was a night owl at the time. 
One night around 3 a.m., I got this alert from one of the campsites saying that they couldn't find their friend. That part of that particular campground was out on a small peninsula. There were some coves and curved roads that made it easy to get turned around walking at night. It actually happened a lot. I got there and the friend seemed a little more scared than usual. They said that they had been searching for an hour already and there was no sign of their friend. They all seemed to be about 18 to 20 years old and smelled of alcohol. I didn't call law enforcement right away because often a drunk person would fall asleep on someone else's chair or picnic table, so we were usually able to find them soon enough. The missing friend had been sleeping in a tent by himself while the rest were still sitting around the fire. Apparently, he was too tired to stay awake anymore and had gone into his tent to lie down. They said around 2 a.m. they heard him rustling around in his tent. They went over to help him out and to see what was going on. He had walked into the nearby trees to relieve himself, but then he didn't come back out the trees. There shouldn't have been much of an area to get lost in. We all kept calling his cell phone. It rang, but there was no answer. I was concerned about drowning too, so I followed his footsteps in the mud, which I was assuming were his. The footprints then stopped abruptly well before the water still in the trees. I looked around and it didn't seem like he could have jumped anywhere and most of the trees around there were too big to be climbed. The footsteps just ended. They didn't backtrack or anything a little weird. We all kept searching until about 4 a.m. and then called it off. I told them let's just wait until morning. It was most likely that he had fallen asleep out of sight somewhere so they all went back to their tents to try to get some sleep. I was way too wired to go home, so I actually kept at it. I was used to staying up all night anyway, and I just wanted to go sit down by the water and stay alert in case I noticed anything. On my way over there, I saw two things dangling down from a tree up ahead, and when I got close enough to see more clearly, I just freaked out. I started backing away. They were feet, but they were not human feet. I just let out this gasp, and then all of a sudden, this thing swooped out of the tree like a bat out of hell. All I could think was that it was some kind of a vulture or something. It was gigantic with probably a ten-foot wingspan, and it had flown down to the water's edge with these huge leathery wings. It was at least as tall as me, and I'm six foot in height. It then turned around, and it looked at me with these red glowing eyes. All of this happened in a matter of seconds. I realized it wasn't any kind of a bird for sure, and it didn't look like it had a beak. It didn't even look like it had a face. I just saw darkness in these red glowing eyes at that point. I became really concerned about the missing friend. I lost it, and I just started yelling at the creature. It turned around and it ran along the shore until I couldn't see it anymore. I was sure we were about to find a dead body, but then I heard this rustling in the bushes and this half-naked person comes crawling out. It was a missing friend. When he was able to make sense, he said that he had gone to the lake to wash himself and the freaky winged thing had scared him half to death. He'd been under the bushes hiding and had passed out by then. I felt like I wasn't even in my right mind anymore. I took the guy back to the campsite, and I eventually got back to my office and checked out. I couldn't take it anymore. I had no clue how to even begin making sense of it all after that. I decided to switch to the day shift, and it ended up being a lot better for me. I eventually left the job at the park in 2008, moved back west, and now work for the state of California. My dad hunts a lot in deep Florida swamps using hound dogs. So the pack of dogs chase the deer, and he chases the dogs, and it leads him to the deer. Well, late one night, his pack wouldn't come to him when he called them. They were chasing something, something that was freaking them out. It was late, and he was ready for them to stop the chase so he could gather them up and call it a night. He also had a suspicion based off how excited they were that they were tracking a bear and not a deer. Eventually he gets to a shallow but wide creek that the dogs won't pass, and in the twilight he sees what they were tracking. 
It was about six foot two, covered in reddish black hair, walking upright and stunk. Whatever it was turned back as it was crossing the creek and locked eyes with my dad and his dogs. My dad says it wasn't a bear or a man. Then it disappeared into the bush on the other side. My dad was so freaked out he ran and left his dogs because they still refused to stop chasing it and wouldn't come to him. He only ever found half of his hound pack. He only ever told family about it. This was maybe ten years ago, and I was sailing with my family, moving a sailboat from the Connecticut shore to Boston. And this happened on an extremely foggy day. I also remember the day being pretty windless as well, so we were just motoring along instead of sailing. Now the general procedure for sailing in such thick fog is to use radar and fog horns to try to prevent any collisions from happening. At some point we started hearing huge loud horn blasts, just repeating from somewhere to our right in the fog. It seemed normal enough someone signaling their position to anyone in the vicinity. Then after maybe 15, 20 minutes of sailing and listening to these horn blasts, we eventually came upon what was making them. Maybe 100 feet from our boat, a huge-ass submarine appeared and looked like it's just sitting still. The weird thing was the suddenness of its appearance. Maybe not the creepiest thing in this thread, but an enormous black shape appearing out of the fog at sea was pretty creepy to me at the time. When I was bow hunting with my dad in Nevada, it was about 45 minutes to an hour before sunset and we were walking back to the truck. When you hunt, you hear birds, the wind through the trees, insects. Well, all of a sudden, it just got dead quiet. No wind, no insects, no birds, nothing. You could hear a pin drop. My dad stopped me and told me to get down low. I, of course, thought he saw a cow elk, and so I got down, and we stayed like that for about ten minutes, just straining to hear something. All of a sudden, we could hear birds, the insects, the wind. Once we got back to the truck, I asked him why we were so quiet, because I didn't see any elk. He said there wasn't any elk, but there was something. I asked him if it was a mountain lion. He said something didn't feel right. I've been hunting these mountains for 30 years, never felt what I felt at that mountain. That was five years ago, and my dad doesn't go back to that area to hunt. Was spending a summer with my grandmother, who lives in southern coastal Oregon. We were taking a walk through one of the many, many little hiking trails peppered about the state, and it was beautiful. The woods were gorgeous. The trees were huge, and the ambient noise was soothing. Then suddenly it just stopped. The birds stopped chirping, the insects stopped buzzing and whirring, the breeze stood dead in the woods, the trees and ferns no longer rustled. It was absolute stillness, like a tableau frozen in a moment. I was spooked solid. I felt really uneasy, and a pit was rapidly forming in my stomach. I tensed up as if by instinct because it felt like something was near. Something with a presence and gravitas to make the whole forest silent. Then it passed, whatever it was, and the sounds of nature started up again. To this day, neither I nor my grandmother know what happened. I was doing a day hike with my girlfriend in a national park in Canada. About six hours up, three hours down, so we were pretty tired and trying to make time before the sun set on the mountains. As we are descending the mountain, I spot three men coming up the trail, still very far off, and something just felt. Off. I can't tell you why I had the initial feeling. After thinking about it, we had started up the mountain a little later than we had planned, and there was no one parked at the trailhead so we absolutely didn't expect people coming up after us, especially since most of the trail is in dense tree cover until you get about four hours up. So there is no point unless you're doing a whole trail. Trying not to freak her out, we stop and I try and get a better view up above us on a little ridge. 
I see them as they walk through a little clearing in the path, and I notice none of them have packs on, and all three are carrying what I thought might have been rifles, but no packs for sure. Jeans, windbreakers, or sweaters, and the fact that we were in the very middle of one of the most highly patrolled and enforced national parks in Canada means these guys were not hunting, and again, I couldn't really tell what they were holding, but I just had a bad, bad feeling. I told my girlfriend I didn't want to meet these guys on the trail as I had a bad feeling, and we pulled a Frodo under a tree stump like 30 feet off the trail. We waited for like 30 minutes-ish and hear them come up the trail, almost on top of us. They were speaking lower, and I didn't really want to go for a closer look at them, but it sounded like they were arguing as we only caught a couple raised words. As they were passing almost the spot we left the trail, they suddenly stopped on the trail and went quiet for a couple seconds. I held my breath, squeezing her hand. A few seconds passed more, and I can feel my muscles tense. I had my four-inch blade trail knife and a Leatherman, but even if the things they were carrying were just sticks, I couldn't fight them if they saw us. I'm six foot and 160 pounds, I'm not much of a fighter. Suddenly they started arguing for a while longer and headed back down the trail. We waited ten more minutes and headed down the trail after them going cautiously. At this point, we were both pretty significantly freaked out. When we neared the trailhead, I stopped her and headed out around the side of the parking lot and saw the three guys more clearly. They had a big old red truck and absolutely had rifles. They waited around in the parking lot, taking turns peeking in my car, looking up the trailhead, and after 45 minutes of waiting them out, the sun came down. They piled in and took off. I didn't get a license plate off the truck because it was facing the wrong way but I stopped at the ranger station on the way out of the mountains and let them know, but never heard back. I have no idea what might have happened if I didn't stop. We pass plenty of people on most of the hikes we do, but seriously, that was just too spooky for me. My uncle was with the Canadian Fisheries as an inspector and recently retired. He told me the story of being in one of the Coast Guard ships, and he was to board a Chinese or Japanese ship, don't remember which, was fishing close to the international water. They often do this so that if they have to hightail it because of something illegal, they can escape. As they were getting there, they noticed the ship being lifted from the water slightly and tilted to the side before settling back in the water and rocking hard from side to side, as if something huge rocked them. They thought it was a whale, but the Asian ship wasn't exactly small, and whales don't do that anyway. The best they could make out from the broken English, they thought they saw a submarine rise underneath them, only to go back down super quickly. Turns out it wasn't a United States submarine either. Could have been Russian. I'd been working as a forest ranger for almost five years. A ranger's day could consist of anything from collecting firewood to tracking down missing hikers. And my day began like most. I would wake up early, walking into work and grabbing my binoculars. As I was about to drive out of the forest, I got a call. That day, I was given a new assignment. I met up with another colleague, a fellow ranger, and we went to the center of this area where somebody had been reporting hearing strange screaming coming from around a cave system nearby. My partner and I decided that I would be able to handle it by myself. He had other things to do, and this was just another run of the mill investigation for me. After he left, I headed towards that area where there had been several unreported mounds to this cave system. Now let me give you some information. This cave system runs pretty deep and there are guided tours. But I also know that this cave system is very expansive and also having a lot of unidentified entrances and holes that can lean deeper into the system. These are also off trails, so myself... I've never actually experienced finding more of these, although I know hikers have reported finding many and even leaving makeshift markers to let other hikers know this was an entrance. 
The parts of the ground here were also dangerous, meaning if you step on the wrong part, the ground below you could collapse, falling into a tunnel. So I had to be very careful about how I approached this entire search. The good news is I wasn't hearing any screaming, so that could be good or bad news. The bad news meaning the hiker, whoever was stuck there, could have been deceased or what. But the good news being that maybe the hiker had gotten themselves out. Anyway, my heart was pounding just by the sheer adrenaline of it. I didn't know why, but something told me to run. It was this feeling in the pit of my gut. As soon as I got there, right around the cavern system, the wind picked up and everything seemed colder than it already was. The gust. Now, I could have begun my investigation in the main entrance, but as I was planning, I heard the scream. It sounded like a person, but they were maybe a couple hundred feet away north. So I marched through the trees, looking, following the source of the screaming, yelling out, Can you hear me? Can you respond? In the screaming ceased. I followed along the rock wall and found this crude hole in the ground, maybe no larger than five feet. It was raked by a rotted tree stump with only one branch on it. This, I knew, probably went down into one of the cave systems. This, by the way, was probably no more than 200 feet away from the main entrance. After crouching down, I was able to slide down at a 45-degree angle into this cave system, landing in a small chamber that I think connected to the others. I always carry a flashlight with me, so I took it out and turned it on. As soon as I did that, the caves plunged into darkness as my battery instantly died. That's when I heard a loud crash. I turned around, or I should say turned to meet the noise, and my flashlight popped back on. There, like out of some sort of sick Stephen King novel, was this grotesque figure, large black eyes covering its entire body, stretching its arms out and moving toward me. And terrified, I wanted to turn and run, but didn't have time as there was another one of these beings coming from the opposite side of the cave, approaching. I turned as fast as I could and fled up the 45-degree incline about the cave. Just as I was turning to climb up, I could hear a third one approaching from directly behind me. Now, I had one coming from my left, my right, and behind me. This one, as I turned and looked, was larger than the other two completely terrified out of my mind, and the sounds of screaming were now apparent, coming deeper in the cavern. I don't know if it was an injured hiker or if these things were making the noise, luring anybody into this tiny crevice, this chamber into the earth. Like I said, the opening to this cavern wasn't large, but I never in a million years would have expected to find things like this. This was horror movie status. I didn't tell anybody else about what I found and kept it to myself. After climbing out of that hole, I ran and I ran and I ran some more, getting back to the station later on. I didn't say a word, and I knew the other rangers wouldn't believe me. And what would I tell them? That I found a cave full of half-arachnids, half-creatures. I mean, they'd probably think I was crazy. Now I've kept this sacred for a while, but... How long can I keep it from the rest of the world? Will my story ever be told to other people? Or should I just stay quiet about what had happened? Let me just apologize and say I'm sorry for the formatting of the story. I'm a terrible writer and I'm not a storyteller, so I apologize in advance. But these creatures that I saw were unlike anything I've ever seen. They really reminded me if you crossed a tarantula with a human. I mean, these were gross. They made this hissing, clicking noise, too. I know it sounds phony through email, but it's really hard for me to convey emotion properly, at least through written communication. With all the information coming out anymore about missing hikers and seeing strange figures and shapes in the woods and all the other bizarre happenings of 2020, I figured, hey, maybe now is an okay time to be open about my experiences and hopefully not experience backlash. I sail a sail a lot. I learned to sail when I was little and have done three transatlantic cruises so far. 
This one time I was doing a transatlantic crossing from the Canaries to St. Lucia. It was late and I was on deck doing an equipment check as per routine when sailing alone. So I am six days into the 14-day journey and it's just nothingness all around. I mean absolutely no lights save for the stars and the moon. I can literally remember this like it was yesterday because I've never seen anything like it before. I was on deck and all of a sudden it was bright, like midday full sun bright. Mind you, it was near 2 a.m. at this point so it made literally no sense. Immediately, I assumed it had to be a flare. Someone needed help. I came to a full stop, lowered the sails, and began radioing on all the emergency channels in Spanish and English. I did this for almost two hours, circling around and checking the radio. There was nothing. Around the second hour, I gave up. I marked the location of my search pattern and kept going. I had no idea what it was. Never saw anything like it again. The whole night lit up like the sun was out for a good three, four seconds. Unbelievable. Last year, my brother was driving through the dark roads of South Shore, Massachusetts, near the Bridgewater Triangle. It was dark, and there's limited street lights in the area. As he was driving, he noticed a cloaked figure standing on the tree line at the side of the road. He described it as wearing white robes and looking almost like a clansman, but without the pointy hat. As he drove by, the figure took notice and pivoted towards him very quickly, making direct eye contact. He became frightened enough that he sped away. I often wonder what he might have seen that night. Most of the town is very dense forest and the roads are unwalkable with no shoulders. So whatever it was likely came out of the woods. It unsettles me knowing the amount of acreage it came out of and whatever this person. If it was a person, was doing on the side of the road watching cars. In July 2018, I was staying in a very isolated region with limited access behind three log gates, 20 miles south of White Thorn, California, on a primitive 4x4 road. This place is at the end of the road, a lost world of primeval forest on the northern border of a vast green belt spreading from Shelter Cove on the Lost Coast, east to Highway 101 and south to Fort Bragg, California. At about 3 a.m. I was awakened. It was a hot, dark, and completely silent July night in these mountains. Something above my tent location, approximately two to three hundred meters, began knocking on wood. It's best described as loud whacks by a big club or branch on a tree trunk. They started one knock, which got my attention. There was a brief hesitation, then several more knocks, but randomly timed. The knocking was loud, so loud that it echoed down the canyon in the stillness. The event lasted only a minute or two. My first thoughts were that there was no one on the mountain who could be out here in the middle of a primitive and protective area. These knocks were from something large, and no North American animal could have made them, listening intently while my mind tried to wrap around how the noise was made. I began to wonder about Bigfoot legends. The night fell silent again. Afterward, I told a few locals and learned that there had been many Bigfoot sightings near Piercy and north of Willow Creek. Fast forward to two weeks ago, while waiting at the first locked gate to the same conservation area, I heard two distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained. As I waited in the dusk for about 45 minutes, waiting to meet a party at the gate who was running late, I heard a very loud wail, scream, or call that I'd never heard before in nature. The sound was coming from the heavily wooded area above me, about two to three hundred meters. I instantly knew where I had heard such an unfamiliar call about three years previous. There's a few second delay from the first call, then a few more, then silence for about a minute leading me to wonder if this whole experience was surreal. It thought that it was an unknown animal or some kind of implausible prank. It was loud and echoing down the mountain, as though some huge creature could belt with the lungs of Pavarotti, 
only much louder. The chance of it being a prankster in this wilderness was highly unlikely, then began another call out at about 30 to 400 meters to the north. It was also just as loud, but came only three calls in succession. It had a distinct higher pitch. This absolutely blew my mind because the first call might be attributed to an elk on steroids, but the response brought chills down my spine. I'll never forget that second vocalization as it was so unique, and this was obviously communication between two individuals in possibly a rudimentary language. Another experience happened just the night before the duo vocalizations on a Friday evening in early November 2019. I had just moved into a cabin that my brother and I rented located along an extremely rugged canyon area of the Mattel River. It was dusk, quite dark, already in the forest. I was outside looking at the stars, taking in the newness of these rugged surroundings. Suddenly, there was a screaming that was so loud and so foreboding that I could only listen in amazement. It was the loudest screaming I've ever heard. I thought it was produced by some kind of banshee from a horror film. The screaming continued at full throttle for over five minutes. I know mountain lions can scream, but nothing like this. It sounded much louder, more guttural, literally as if someone had set up loudspeakers and played the bloodiest scream that Hollywood could produce. I wondered if someone was up on the mountainside pranking me as a newcomer to the neighborhood. I listened for a bit, then went inside and told my brother about it because it was so unnerving. Bigfoot did not ever enter my mind. But then at dusk, the very next evening, I heard two calls while waiting at the gate. I've since been over and over in my mind, why have I been so lucky to hear and experience these mysterious sounds, much less three distinct vocalizations which cannot be explained in a 24-hour period? I've been to a lot of different wilderness areas during my life, but those sounds in that specific location were simply remarkable. I've been searching for answers to this for years, but never found anything like it or that could explain. Basically, I'd just moved into a new house in a suburban-ish area in northern United Kingdom. A few months after we were settled, we invited a friend round for some drinks. At somewhere around 1 a.m., 2 a.m., a very loud sound could be heard throughout the house. The closest thing I can compare it to is microphone feedback. It was very high-pitched and almost hurt to hear, except it was more of a defined note than feedback. It started off quietly and was drawn out in the distance, but it sounded like it got progressively closer and louder each time it rung. I say rung because it was like it faded in and out a few times, almost like a long tone. The whole thing lasted only about 20 seconds. Safe to say we were all absolutely freaked out afterwards and had to confirm to each other that we had actually heard it the same. We all brushed it off as too much to drink and some weird electric noise somewhere. Because it was so out of the blue, freaky, and over so quickly nobody thought to record it. A few months later, my fiancé and I were in bed. He was asleep by this point and I was trying to get to sleep. That's when I heard it again. This time it wasn't as loud, almost as if it didn't come as close, but it sounded as if it was traveling. I woke my fiancé up as I was freaked out again, but he was too sleepy to acknowledge anything at this point. The final time it happened was when I was in bed again. This time it woke me up. I didn't bother to wake my fiancé this time as it seemed much quieter this time. Neither of the times when in bed did I have time to record it as I'd have to cross the room to my phone to do so. Any ideas what this could be? We've put it down to some kind of electrical sound. It only seems to happen at night or in the early hours of the morning. The first time we heard it confirms that I'm not the only one who can hear it. I live on an ordinary street with an office building nearby and a few small shops a street away. The area just outside of here is quite rural. I have also heard about these sky trumpets. However, the sounds I have heard are nothing like in like any of these. No Google search has yielded any results either. It was just so loud and odd. It's driving me crazy. 
I'd just love to have an explanation, or even someone who might have experienced something similar. About 10, 12 years ago, I remember going fishing with a friend around my family's property in rural South Dakota. I was 14 or 15 at the time and had my learner's permit. We can drive earlier in SD, so I took our small farm truck down to our creek with my friend. I grew up on a farm, and the creek we let our cattle drink from was often full of fish. While fishing, a neighbor of mine drove by and said hi. We had some normal fishing small talk, and he asked if we would like to try fishing his creek on his property. We hadn't had much luck, so my friend and I said we would give it a shot. We followed him to his creek, and he told us we could keep whatever we caught if we wanted. He noticed we also had a 17 HM as a rifle with us. We always have one in our truck in case we had predators around livestock and such. He mentioned he had some badgers digging holes around his stock. Damn, and if we saw one, he would be all right. If we got rid of it so his cattle didn't injure a leg walking to the water, we packed up our stuff and walked down the short dirt road to the creek. The creek was to the east of us and ran in the north or south direction. On the south side of the road there was a hill, formed red from dirt, when the stock dam was dug out for his cattle and the creek ran into the dam on the other side. We went to the mouth of the dam where the creek led in and fished for a while, noticing it was eerily quiet. Normally there would be a lot of noise on a night like this. No wind in South Dakota means you will be nearing all sorts of bugs, frogs, etc. But there was absolutely nothing. We thought that was strange, but fishes anyway. We were catching a lot of decent-sized fish. My friend was planning to stay at my house for a couple of days, so we decided we would keep a few to fry up the next day for lunch. To do this, we needed our net and stronger to keep the fish. Since it was a short walk, we left our poles where they were. There were no fish big enough to pull them in, and walked back to the truck quick. On the way back, we heard some trashing on the opposite side of the hill mentioned earlier. This was odd because we were just on that side while fishing. When we reached the opposite end, we looked to see if a badger had been there, like my neighbor mentioned. There was nothing, but we could see where something had knocked down some cattails and other straw-type grass. What was weird was that way more seemed to be knocked down than what a badger could do. And none had been knocked down while we were on the other side just minutes earlier. Either way, we continued back to get our netting and stringer. This time on our way back, keep in mind the road from truck to fishing spot is probably 100 feet. If that, we heard what sounded like a huge bird flapping around in the same spot as the thrashing. The only large birds we have in that area are vultures, hawks, eagles, and owls. I've seen and heard all of these birds up close before. This sounded much larger and the flapping was way more sporadic and quick than any of those birds moved their wings. It was very eerie and we started to get a little scared. We decided to hustle back to where we were fishing to try and see what it was. When we got there, however, again there was nothing. We looked at each other and mentioned how weird it was and joked that it freaked us out a little. Then we noticed something had moved out fishing poles. The two poles had swapped places. At first I thought my head was playing tricks, until we saw our lawn chairs. This confirmed something switched the poles because they were sitting near the foot of the opposite chairs now. This really started freaking us out, so we decided to start packing up and leave. As we were packing up, we started to hear a noise coming from the second dirt hill on the opposite side of the pond. Most ponds are dug such that there are two dirt hills on either side. There were cattails and reeds leading around the water to the other hill, where the creek exited the stock dam. Now we could hear footsteps coming from the other side of the hill. We thought maybe it was my neighbor, but then we heard a combination of noises that scared the absolute hell from us. We heard the thrashing from before, coupled with the flapping, and a new noise. This was like a growling or snarling noise, which made no sense. 
I have heard coyotes, foxes, badgers, opossums, and all other manner of animal I grew up with growl or snarl at some point. This sounded like none, and the footsteps were large and heavy, like a bipedal animal, not soft and swift like a coyote. By now we were absolutely terrified. I grabbed the gun and we sprinted back to the truck. It was getting dark at this point. I told my friend to drive since I had the gun. We got in. He turned the headlights on and we could see the splashing coming from the stock, damn, from where the truck was parked. We wanted to try and get a better look at what was splashing around, but were too scared. My friend backed us into the road and we sped home with me clutching the gun the whole way. We never told anyone what happened and have only mentioned it to each other once to this day. Does anyone have any clue what it could have been? To this day, I still get eerie when driving around the back roads near home. Edit, so someone has asked about my grandpa's UFO story, so I will share that as well. It's nothing spectacular as far as UFOs go, but still interesting in my eyes. I was very, very young when this happened. My mother had been divorced for just a couple years and had been working a lot. After she divorced, she moved us back home with my grandparents. She saved up some money and decided to take my siblings and I on a little family outing for a few days to the Black Hills of South Dakota. I want to say this was around the 4th of July, but I'm not going to say I know that for sure. While gone, my grandfather, grandmother, deceased, and dog, good girl but deceased, were sitting on our porch around 9 at night. Our deck on the house faced the west and they were looking outward. I would like to add that there was zero visual obstruction as they were facing a field with zero trees in sight. Our dog began barking and growling. It was not totally out of character as she did this to predators that would venture close to the livestock or poultry. What was strange is my grandparents could not see anything around. As if from nowhere they saw the UFO materialize almost instantaneously in the sky over our pasture. Our dog continued barking and my grandparents stood awestruck. My grandfather described the UFO as four large lights arranged in a vertical fashion with four smaller lights orbiting it in a figure eight sort of pattern. He said it seemed relatively close to the ground, but it never made any noise and there was never any dust lifted from the ground from a propulsion source. This was before camera phones were popular and so my grandfather ran inside to get our cam. Quarter. When he returned, it disappeared. My grandfather said that my grandmother saw it dart off into the night sky. My grandparents were completely flabbergasted by what happened. Having no idea what they had just seen, the consulted books, our family actually had a very large assortment of books. To avail through that, they turned to the Internet. I can't imagine trying to research something like this. I'm on dial up in the late 90s, but nonetheless, they found similar images with UFO headlines. My grandparents were very religious and never entertained the idea of something like this until they saw one, probably part of the reason my grandfather was so apprehensive about sharing with others. He would not believe it himself had he been told. After this, they were very open to the idea of the paranormal and still maintained their faith. They just accepted that there were things they could explain through their religion and accepted that. They actually would watch a lot of programs on TV about paranormal stuff, which got me interested early on. I would also like to add my grandfather is a very credible man. He served as a United States Army Ranger in Vietnam and worked on a lot of covert operations. He was relatively high up towards the end of his active duty career. We have several photos of him in the Pentagon, some talking with who I believe was the Secretary of Defense at the time. Not 100% sure, but I know it was a high-ranking official. At this time, my grandfather was still actively working with the recruiting office at our local National Guard base. He had a very good idea of aircraft capabilities of most types of aircraft from when he served, all the way to the time he saw the UFO. He has seen, shot out of, and been shot at by all manner of aerial weaponry. 
Nothing he has seen had maneuvering capabilities like what he saw or, or the ability to stay silent while maintaining low-level flight and cause no ground disturbance from the propulsion system. He also claimed that had something been flying the craft, it would have to have been very small. A humanoid creature would have to be roughly the size of a child to adequately move in the craft. I've never seen a UFO. And I guess I've never technically outright seen a humanoid being, but I have had a strange encounter that is unexplainable by conventional means, and I believe my grandfather did as well, albeit a different type of encounter. I live in a small wood cabin on a farm in the countryside of Catalonia, Spain. Usually shared with one other person, I had a few weeks alone. Never lock the door. Hot weather means bedroom window is open, although wooden shutters are closed, with thin gaps to outside. Pitch black surroundings. I had one of those nights where it's hard to sleep. Around 4 a.m., I hear screaming in the distance. There are around five typically sized fields between cabin and the village. Although this is far, I assume it's someone in the village messing around. Goes quiet. Starts again. This time it's clear that the person is screaming something. Although not a native to the area, I know this isn't language. It's gibberish. He is screaming words that completely don't make sense, and that I've found it impossible to imitate sense, and he's screaming them angrily. I'm on edge now. But I tell myself it's a drunk person on their way home in the night. Half an hour later, I've calmed down, and it's been quiet for quite a while. Then I hear the voice again. This time, there is no screaming. I can hear them speaking the gibberish at a normal level. This means that they are within the property. I freeze, too frightened to go lock my front door. The front door area has a lot of windows, and I'm afraid to see them them to see me and instead stare at my bedroom door with a plan to barricade should I hear someone entering the cabin. The muttering fades away just as the sun begins to rise. I lock my door now. This took place in 2019, one night coming home from a friend's party. It was me, my girlfriend, my brother, his girlfriend, and her friend, we had an extra seed, and she was staying with us. We were making our way home and decided to take a road that would cut our travel time down. Everything was cool until my brother wanted to stop at the gas station to get gas and food since he believed in the classic gas out cliche. We arrived at the gas station, and he decided to go in and get food while I stayed with the girls. Everything was going normally until a big black 18-wheeler semi-truck pulled into the station. We thought nothing of it. I wasn't paying much attention to him until he got out of the truck and stared at us. When I say staring, he was looking into our souls. Now I was worried, and my brother was still in the store. We couldn't see his face as he had a hoodie on covering his entire face. I was skeptical, and so were the girls. He was doing a lot of suspicious things, like going behind the trailer peeking his head around and even walking on the other side of our car and standing there. We locked the doors and I immediately called my brother, who held the door for him. The two bumped into one another. My brother had food and got into the car. We immediately sped off, heading towards the highway. There was this long stretch of road before getting back on the main highway. We were talking about the truck and how weird he was acting. Some time went by, and that same truck had followed us, but he passed us at fast speeds, nearly taking us off the road. We couldn't make anything out because it was a white trailer with no company labels. We were scared now, and we put it to full speed. We had lost him since our car was faster. Long story short, we got back to our house and parked our car in the garage. Now that we were settling down, all chilling in the living room, we saw bright lights outside our house, and it was the same truck passing through. It was scary because trucks never pass on our road. We were scared that he had followed us. Turning the lights off, we waited the whole night to see if he'd return, but he never did. And we never saw him again. 
It was one of the truly creepy experiences we had seen before. Ages ago, when my father was still racing small sailboats, he did a number of races that took multiple days. So he and the crew would have to spend at least one night on the water. One particular race had started under nasty weather conditions that quieted down to light fog in the evening. My dad and the crew were exhausted and looking forward to taking turns getting some well-needed sleep. My dad's buddy took the first watch on deck while the rest of them went to bed. It seemed like only minutes had passed when the guy on watch shook my dad awake. You have to see this. You have to tell me I'm not crazy, was all his buddy would say. Now pretty spooked, my dad went up on deck to see what had scared his friend so much. The guy pointed into the dark fog, and suddenly my dad saw a pair of glowing eyes. They turned this way and that, like a creature lazily looking around. Sometimes it would look away, but it would eventually turn back to gaze in their direction. For a moment, Dad thought it must be some bizarre kind of lighted boy, but the movement pattern was completely random, and the eyes were moving up and down, completely at odds with the movement of the waves. And it was getting closer, confused, exhausted, and now pretty damn concerned. My dad woke the rest of the crew and brought everybody up to see this. Thing! Yep, everybody saw it, but nobody could identify it as anything other than eyes. The movement was so eerie and it was approaching pretty fast. As it swam closer, it was clear that whatever it was, it was enormous. Now everyone was starting to freak out. Dad had no idea what to do except to try to move out of its way. But the damn monster kept moving around. The crew finally determined its rough path and altered course to avoid it. It was getting very close now. They could hear the rush of water around its bulk and a strange groaning and hissing. It was getting closer and closer. Blat. Everyone's heart stopped when the horn shattered the night. Suddenly they saw dim navigation lights through the fog and realized the monster was riding a big-ass barge. They watched in silence as the bulk of the barge materialized. As it passed alongside, they realized it was carrying a load of garbage and there was a little bulldozer driving around, pushing the garbage into tidy piles. The monster's eyes were the headlights moving around, climbing up and down the mounds and circling around the deck. They were pretty relieved, but then Dad realized that they had basically almost run into a giant barge. So nobody got much sleep that night as they kept watch for more monsters in the fog. Back in August 2006, I was 20 years old and working in a deli near my house, while I also attended a community college nearby. I remember it was a warm summer night, and I was working till close, which was 7 p.m., and at the time it was around 6.30 p.m. The only two people left in the deli were my boss and I. I remember I was stocking drinks in the cooler towards the back of the store when I heard the front door open. So naturally I looked and it was a guy I had never seen before. And working at the same Belay for eight plus years, you tend to remember people. And so I figured he might have been from out of town. He had red hair and it almost looked like an afro, which I thought was strange. He walks back towards me and he goes into the cooler and grabs a peach snapple and soon as he walked past me, the smell hit me. So I motioned to my boss and pinched my nose and he and I had a brief chuckle before I started walking to the front to ring the guy up. I get to the counter and soon as I looked up at this guy, I felt my stomach drop. His eyes were black and he had pale skin and this blank stare. It's hard to explain, but I felt as if he was looking through me and not at me. I asked him if he needed a bag, and I got no response. He paid for the snapple and walked outside of the deli and then stood at the front of the store. So we closed up the store at 7, and we started cleaning up, and 7.30 comes around, and I look, and this guy is still standing at the front of the store, leaning up against the glass. He was so strange that my boss thought he was staking out the place waiting for us to leave, but technically he was a paying customer, 
so we couldn't tell him to leave just for being weird. So we shut the lights off and we're walking out when my boss turns to the guy and says, Hey, uh, I don't mind you hanging out here, but please don't lean on the glass. The guy turns to him and doesn't say a word. He just smashes the Snapple bottle on the ground at my boss's feet. And my boss at the time was a big guy. I'm talking about six foot, 380 pounds and covered in tattoos. So my boss gets in his face and says, what the F is wrong with you, dude? Now you're going to clean that shit up. The guy stares back at him again, not saying a word, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, this guy is either insane or has the largest testicles on earth. Then after a few seconds, he turns away and gets in his car and drives off. I go back inside and get a broom, and I swept it up, and we called it a night wasn't the first time we had someone high come into the store. The next morning I woke up and put the news on and the first thing I see is that guy's face. Turns out the same night he stopped by our delay, he murdered and dismembered his neighbor right down the street from the deli. The cops caught him pulling up into his parents' driveway the next morning with a woman's severed head in his trunk. To this day I wonder whether or not he committed the murder before or after he came to the D-Light. I don't remember seeing any blood on him, but then again, I wasn't really looking for any. I live in an odd little place in Appalachia that was supposedly carved out of the mountains by a meteor. There is a 360 degree view of mountains around me at all times. Well, when I was in middle school, I got really into mountain biking. It was the 90s, don't ask. So because I was so young, and since my mom didn't want me to be on some random mountain path that didn't have anyone on it for months, she would only let me go on deep trail with a guy who owned the bike shop and was also a co-worker, as she was a teacher. Well, it had been months since I started doing weekly rides with the guy Joe was his name and a few other guys he had rode with. We went up this place we called Lake Hill as it was the road to the city's water supply, which was a lake-sized natural spring. We'd been riding for hours. I mean, like daybreak to probably an hour before dark. We just got to the point where we were going to turn around when we crest this hill and bam, there stands a dude. Wearing camo gear, a yellow raincoat in the middle of summer, standing about 15 feet away from a four-wheeler with a shotgun in his hand. Joe, who was the most athletic of us, was in front. I think I had gotten behind him and there were two other guys behind me. When you're pedaling a mountain bike up a steepish hill, you're not looking forward. You're looking down, or at least at the ground. You're studying where your wheel is going so you don't run over anything that might ruin your momentum. So when I ran into the back of Joe, I was kinda pissed. I looked up sharply and saw Joe positioning himself between me and the dude. The man said nothing. Not one single word. Not a word of comfort or compassion for the fact we just ran up on him with a shotgun. This is the South. People are hospitable. You don't see two strangers in a deserted place not say hello to one another. I swear it might be the fact I've played this event over in my head dozens of times and want to read in it what I think was happening, or this is really what happened. Guy, these mother have just found me harvesting my pot. What if they tell the cops? Can I afford to take that chance? I don't know. There are a few of them. Shit, that one's a kid, because I could see an edge of tension bleed out of his face when he looked at me. I swear it was him deciding to kill Joe, then deciding not to kill me. Joe, to his credit, positioned himself between the man and me the whole time. Eventually, the dude hopped on his four-wheeler, covered in plants, and rode away. I never will forget that taste of exhaustion and adrenaline as we came off that hill. Luckily, in mountain bike, riding the ups are the hard part. We were doing the fastest speed I still have ever done on a bike while in the mountains. I'm actually feeling cold and nervous talking about this. I live in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania, in Delaware County. I went to college in Philadelphia. My parents moved to Florida a few months ago, but they kept their house here. 
so I'm living in it right now. The property is along the bank of the Delaware River. The river is twenty or so yards from the back door of the house. I'd found a new job, and I stayed up later and later. I was bored and with nobody else to hang out with. Most nights I would wind up outside in a lawn chair, fishing in the river until three in the morning. It was on a night like this when the first incident happened. I wasn't paying too much attention around me. I was watching something on my phone and my rod started bouncing around like crazy. I jumped up to set the hook, jerking it back. The line went slack for a second and then jerked away. I figured I had a fish on, but when I tried to reel again, it wouldn't budge. I thought maybe I was snagged, but then the line snapped away again. I'm not an expert fisherman, but the way the line moved was odd. Not like a typical fish bite, but like something in the water was purposely pulling back on the line each time I did. It was almost like it was intelligent. I was a bit freaked out, and I ended up just cutting the line and heading back inside. I told myself it was caught on a snag or something, but I suspected otherwise. A week later, I had fallen asleep in my chair, and I woke up startled after hearing a large splash in the water just a few yards out. The light from my back porch barely hit the edge of the water, and I could see a series of rings spreading out from where something had entered the water. A new set of rings then appeared. A few feet away, and then again and again until they were out of sight. I was a bit baffled since catfish or bottom feeders seldom come to the surface of the water, and they rarely jump. I grabbed my gear and headed inside, but in my groggy state I left my cutting board knife and a fresh bag of bait. I used pepperoni for catfish, sitting on the ground outside. The next day I realized what I had done, and I went outside to retrieve it. Everything was gone. In the patch of dirt near where I had left the stuff, I could see faint prints, some kind of thin-footed animal with only two long, slender toes had been walking through the area. I also found silvery fish scales that were spread sporadically around, and both prints and the scales led straight back to the water's edge. I must admit that at this point I was a little bugged out. I didn't know what to make of the evidence, but I figured that any kind of call to the police was going to get me laugh at. I tried to find information on the prints online, but with no luck. I decided that I would give fitting a rest for a while. I needed to get better sleep anyway. I was starting to get tired halfway through the day at work. Two weeks went by, and I hadn't been back outside to fish. I had started dating a new girl. Between her and work, I pretty much forgot all about the tracks. But then the most bizarre incident occurred. I was fast asleep in the room upstairs when I was shaken awake by my girlfriend. She told me that my dog was downstairs barking like crazy. I'm a heavy sleeper and probably wouldn't have noticed, but sure enough, he was downstairs going nuts. Before I reached the stairs, the barking abruptly stopped, but then it turned into a low growl. I felt a twinge of panic. My girlfriend was behind me on the stairs, and we crept down quietly. I could see the dog standing at the back door in a rigid posture growling at something outside. I walked quietly over to him and tried to calm him down. I was stroking his head when I heard my girlfriend let out a gasp. She was looking through the small window of the back door. I stood up to look for myself. Unmistakably, there were two bipedal creatures, no more than three feet tall, walking around my backyard. It was dark and the lights were off, but I could make out a pallid silver color to them. They had no eyes that I could see, but something like a fin was running along the spine of each creature. We stood frozen for a few moments watching these two creatures. At one point, they ambled over to each other. I swear that they were making hand gestures toward the house. My girlfriend saw this too and whispered that she was going to call the cops. She ran upstairs to grab her phone while I stayed and watched for a few more minutes. My dog started barking again, and this time both creatures just walked away towards the river and disappeared under the water. The police arrived about twenty minutes later and looked around. They didn't see any sign of the creatures, but said that they had found some wet prints outside. They were the exact same ones that I had seen on the ground a few weeks ago. Since no crime was committed, they didn't seem too interested, but the officers took my report and told me to call again if anything else happened.
So this was a month ago. I've looked online for any kind of information on these creatures, but I can't find anything. I haven't gotten a good night's sleep since, and my girlfriend has refused to come back to the house. Do you have any idea what these creatures may have been? The crisp morning air embraced me as I tightened the straps on my backpack, preparing for our daring patrol into the uncharted territory of Yellowstone National Park. I was part of a team of park rangers who was tasked with exploring the untouched depths of the wilderness, mapping new trails, and ensuring the safety of both visitors and wildlife. With a mixture of excitement and caution, we set off into the dense forest, the towering trees forming a majestic canopy above us. Each step echoed through the serene silence, our boots crushing twigs and leaves beneath them. The beauty of nature surrounded us, but so did the untamed mysteries that lay hidden within. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, our senses sharpened, our eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of disturbance. Suddenly, a faint cry broke through the stillness of the forest. We exchanged glances, our instincts alerting us to something amiss. Following the anguished sound, we stumbled upon an injured camper, his face etched with pain and fear. Blood stained his clothes, and his trembling hands clutched a makeshift bandage over a deep gash on his arm. We rushed to his side, offering assistance and asking what had befallen him. His voice quivered as he recounted his terrifying encounter. He described a creature massive and hairy, with eyes that seemed to penetrate his very soul. It resembled a Bigfoot, a creature often dismissed as folklore. Skepticism flickered in our eyes, but an empathy compelled us to listen further. The injured camper revealed how the creature attacked him without warning, its strength overwhelming. He fought back with all his might, desperately struggling to free himself from its grip. In a stroke of desperation, he managed to strike a blow that sent the beast sprawling. Believing it to be dead, he escaped. But the trauma had clouded his memory of the exact location. Our gazes shifted between disbelief and concern. Could it be possible? Were we standing face to face with evidence of a creature? We assessed the situation, weighing our duty to the injured camper against the unknown dangers that lurked in the depths of the park. Realizing that his life hung in the balance, we made a collective decision to prioritize his well-being. Carefully, we helped him to his feet, supporting his wounded arm. Navigating through the wilderness, our group communicated with the local hospital, arranging for an immediate transfer of the injured camper. The journey was arduous. We formed a protective shield around him, ensuring his safety as we traversed the untamed terrain. Finally reaching the edge of the wilderness, we handed him over to the waiting medical professionals. Exhausted yet satisfied that we had fulfilled our duty, we watched as he was whisked away to receive the urgent care he needed. Though skeptical of his encounter, we couldn't shake off the nagging curiosity that lingered within us. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I've been an outdoorsy type ever since I was a child. Always been a fan of foraging for food and hiking, but I had an experience a few years ago that changed that. I was up in some deep forest just foraging like usual and out of nowhere. I had this chill run up my spine and felt an intense primal fear. I immediately became scared because I've never had this kind of intense fear grip me. I thought it was a black bear nearby or a cougar stalking me, so I pulled out my handgun and started to creep around looking for a safe place. I found this little clearing and crouched down so I could listen to the forest. I didn't hear anything except the usual little rustle and wind, so I thought it was okay. I get up to leave and I see this enormous hulking thing watching me about 50 yards away, maybe 20 yards inside the forest on the other side of the clearing. Not even hiding, just standing there like a tree. I actually thought it was a tree at first because it was probably eight feet tall and three feet wide. Must have been 800 or 1,000 pounds. As soon as I saw its eyes, I was paralyzed with fear. 
probably would have shit myself if I had any in my system. And it was super quiet, too. I never heard it even when it started to walk off. I just felt its presence nearby. Not a this thing wants to kill me presence, just a this thing could kill me if it wanted to, an easily kind of fear. I just stand there looking at it, it looking back at me. After about 30 seconds, it felt like an hour, I started to back away slowly, keeping close to the ground in a kind of I don't mean any harm way. Soon as I started to move, it just walked off. I think it had a fair bit of intelligence, and once it saw, I didn't want to do it any harm. It just left. It might have also just been curious. So yeah, saw Bigfoot once, and it scared the living hell out of me. And let me tell you, a handgun wouldn't have done shit to this thing except piss it off. Even a shotgun might not have stopped it. Heard one while camping in the deep forest a few years later, too. It had this weird scream like an angry man, animal, too deep to be a human butt, and definitely not an animal, it was like some animal-human thing, wailed like an angry banshee. And I've been out in the forest for enough years to be able to identify all the animal calls, so I know this wasn't anything animal. If I go hiking or camping these days, it's right on the edge of the forest, in an area that plenty of people go around. F going exploring in the deep forest. By the way, I've been in the deep forest probably over 1,000, 1,500 times and only ran into this creature once, and only heard it once, so it's exceptionally rare. So I was just about 20, 4 years old, when my cousin Charlie had gotten throat cancer. He wasn't really my cousin, he was my dad's cousin, but for whatever reason, I always called him Cousin Charlie. Anyways, he and his wife lived up around San Luis Obispo, and when he was finally recovering from cancer, he went to stay in his estate in mainland Hawaii. At one point, he needed someone to babysit his house in San Luis, and I volunteered. Fast forward, I'm staying at his place by myself. We're talking satellite internet and television slower than a snail. I had found myself enthralled in a Lord of the Rings marathon and proceeded to stay up till around 2.30 a.m. Changing the channel meant whatever channel I was clicking meant it would choose four stations down from my selection, so I was hesitant to change the channel. The marathon ends and I proceed to make some green tea. That's when I hear it. A distant scream calls across the valley below. I knew it was a human scream, but for some reason I just refused to believe it. The thing about houses inland from San Luis is that you have a lot of room between your neighbors. We're talking about two miles apart from each other. If someone played music on the other side of the hill, you had no problem hearing it. I thought maybe they screamed because they were watching a scary film, or perhaps they were playing a board game. I really don't know, I just did my best to imagine it was me over-exaggerating. About two minutes had gone by, and I passed it off at this time, getting lost in infomercials. That's when I heard something familiar to a firecracker, but then I heard it multiple times. Something didn't seem right, so I grabbed the nearest blunt object and headed upstairs. My cousin Charlie has a 360 degree second deck, which I proceeded to go and take watch on with a fire poker. Like that would do me any good. I listened, but I could only hear the wind. I would later end up falling asleep in one of the rocking chairs and then waking up about 40 minutes later. What I later found out from my cousin Charlie is that a man had got into a big argument with his wife and shot her as she ran from the house. I also later found out that because I was the only one who had left the outside lights on that she had run towards me, but died from her wounds about 60% of the way here. This still gives me chills. I live near Greensboro, North Carolina. The date that the incidents began was 2022. Two weeks after moving to this address, I witnessed trees in the park behind my home, moving as though there was a huge heavy being moving from one tree to the other, but I could not see any visible being. 
though I know that this movement was not caused by the wind. Since then, I have seen a variety of strange, unreal things that I would never have imagined ever seeing in real life, except on sci-fi film. I have tried to take photographs of these anomalies, but nothing is ever captured. I've used a digital camera and an old Polaroid, but to no avail. There is something outside in my trees, and it is not squirrels. I can feel them watching me and have seen their neon green eyes staring back at me from inside of the thick tree cover, where they try to hide and blend in with the leaves on the top of the trees. Something is definitely wrong here, and it really has me frightened. I know something has come into my home and assaulted me with scratches on my back and left of blood. Red scab at the base of my skull. It was as though it was punctured with a sharp object such as a needle. I'm convinced that the government and other officials in this community know about the activity. I collected some hair evidence that I know is not human. The hair is too thin and wispy, and the color is greenish in hue. I don't know what to do. Someone suggested I reach out to you so I won't lose my sanity. I never, in my wildest dream would have ever imagined these things to actually be real. It's difficult for me to accept the reality of it. Please contact me so I won't feel so alone in this madness. Thank you. Where my mom's house is, there is a river that runs behind it with nothing but forests surrounding it. Some truly creepy shit has happened to us and some friends more than once down there at the river. First story, me, my boyfriend, and a couple of friends were camping out on the river sandbar. I had my dog with me. Her name is Anna. We were having a bonfire and setting up the tents before everyone showed up. Then Tim, my boyfriend Robert, his friend, went into the woods to look for more firewood so I could watch the fire and keep it going until they came back. This left me and Anna by the fire by ourselves. Anna is very protective and I felt safe with her. After they went into the woods, I immediately felt someone or something staring at me from across the river. This river was not very wide, but there was very thick forest on the other side that abruptly stopped right at the river's edge. Anna senses it too and got up from where she was laying at by the fire walked down to the river enough that all four of her paws were in the water. All the hairs on her back standing straight up, and she's staring and pointing with one paw up at the ray's edge across the river. I follow her and stand directly behind her and also stare across the river. I suddenly hear whatever it is move. So does Anna. And it's not just regular human footsteps I'm hearing. It's moving trees. It sounded as if it was moving trees and branches out of the way to walk. Anna is following it moving where it moves, but staying on our side of the river, and she's deeply growling. It's like time was frozen. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I couldn't see it because the fire was way up on the river bank, and Anna and I were on the river's ledge with our feet in the water. Both of us are just staring into the woods across the river. Anna finally stopped moving and now is closer and her legs are in the water now and she's steadily growling. I'm behind her with my feet up to mid-chin in the water. I finally snap out of it and run back up by the fire and call for Tim and Robert. Anna stayed where she was, still growling. They hear me and come back with firewood. Tim says, what's wrong? I said, you didn't hear that, Robert said. Hear what? I said. There's something across the river, and it doesn't sound human. Anna won't stop growling at it. So the two guys walk to the river's edge, and Robert grabs the pellet gun he brought with him. Tim walks up to Anna and says, What is it, girl? What do you see? And she's not breaking her stare, just constantly growling. All of a sudden, Robert and Tim hear it shift, as do I, and Anna shifts with it to the left. Well, when it shifts, Robert aims the pellet gun where he heard the shift and fires a pellet into the woods. No sooner than we heard the pellet hit something, we all heard a low, guttural, deep growl for like a second. Once Anna heard the growl, she backed up and got close to Tim and whines a little bit. Then nothing. 
It's as if it just disappeared. I said, screw that, and walked my ass back up to my mom's house, and we canceled the camping for the night. Second story, we are halfway down the trail that leads to this river, with Robert and a few other friends. My mom's didn't like a lot of people over at her house. We are just hanging out, talking and bullshitting around, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it sounded as if a horse neighed, but more like a laugh. And everyone in our small group heard it, so we noped out of there and go back to my mom's, and are in my mom's yard, and we all hear it again, clear as day, a horse, neighing, laugh, at the very beginning of the trail. The beginning of the trail is adjacent to my mom's yard. It gave us all chills, and we couldn't logically explain it. No one in the neighborhood owns horses, nor has there ever been any in that neighborhood. Third story. Again, we, Tim and our friends, were in the trail of the river. This time, we were walking down to the river. It was midsummer, and a lot of people were down there. We were looking forward to swimming and having a fun time. We get halfway down the trail, and we all see a solid black wolf sitting in the middle of the trail near the end of it, facing us. I remember it clearly. It has yellow eyes and gray around its snout, like it was older. This was at 12 p.m., 12.30 p.m. on a bright, sunny day, and people were in the water. You could hear them laughing and splashing. We all stop in our tracks and stare at it. About five people just staring in silence at this black wolf, scared to move or make any noise. It stares at us back, and I shit you not, it grinned at us. Not a typical dog grin where they pant and have their mouth open. No, this was more like a sinister, mischievous grin with sharp teeth and bright yellow eyes. It made my stomach turn. We were about 50 feet from it, and after about five minutes it stopped grinning, and it simply got up on its hind legs and walked away as if it was a human. We all just looked at each other, asking if we all saw it, and everyone saw the exact same thing. I believe we came across a skinwalker that day. I didn't tell my friends that's what it was, but I knew that's what it was. We said screw swimming that day and left. That was the last time we ever went to that river again. I've never been one to dwell on the supernatural or the unexplainable, but there are moments in life when reality blurs with the inexplicable and you're left questioning the very fabric of existence. What I'm about to recount is one of those moments a chapter from my time as a special forces soldier working alongside the CIA deep within the heart of Mexico. Our mission was anything but routine. We were tasked with infiltrating a top-secret government facility known as Project Spectre. It was supposedly a biolab, but the secrecy surrounding it was suffocating. Our journey through the shadows of this underground complex would forever etch horrors into my memory. As we navigated the labyrinthine passages of the facility, the oppressive air seemed to weigh us down. Our team had dealt with cartel members earlier on our way in, but nothing could have prepared us for what awaited us deep within the bowels of Project Spectre. The complex was a maze of sterile white walls and cold metallic surfaces. We passed by strange surgical apparatus, each more horrifying than the last. Our senses were on high alert, every creak of a door and distant eerie hum amplifying our unease. Then on one occasion, as we ventured further into the facility, we encountered something that defied all reason. It appeared suddenly like a specter emerging from the shadows, and the sight of it sent chills down my spine. The creature had a pale, human-like hand with large claws and skin that glistened like glass, as though it were covered in a clear, viscous liquid. Its face was a grotesque mask of milky white skin, with eyes that were an unnatural shade of blue, veins pulsating beneath them. Its long serpentine tongue darted in and out of its gaping maw, the only thing in motion other than the trees swaying outside in the wind. But what truly terrified us were its antlers, dark as mold, 
rising like twisted branches from its massive deer like humanoid frame. It must have stood at least seven to eight feet tall, a nightmarish fusion of man and beast. The creature's appearance was beyond comprehension, and before we could react, it lunged at us with a feral roar that sent shivers down our spines. We opened fire, our bullets finding their mark, or so we thought. The creature seemed unfazed, its glassy skin deflecting our shots, and it tackled us with a force that was otherworldly. We fought with every ounce of strength and determination, but the creature was relentless. Its antlers scraped against the walls, and its grip was unyielding. It seemed to have no purpose other than to sow chaos and terror. In the end, the creature vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving us battered and bewildered. We searched every corner of the facility, but there was no trace of the enigmatic being. It was as though it had slipped back into the shadows from whence it came. As I recount this harrowing tale, I know that there will be skeptics who doubt the veracity of my story, but I assure you it is a true account of the horrors I witnessed in the depths of Project Spectre. The scars, both physical and mental, serve as a chilling reminder that there are forces in this world that defy explanation and reason. Some secrets are better left hidden, and some horrors are better left unspoken. My cousin did a lot of forest surveying in some pretty remote areas in British Columbia, Canada. He and a colleague were driving down an old logging road when a whip van passed them, going the opposite direction. He said it was odd to see someone way out there, but not unheard of, as hunters do use these roads. They went a few more miles down the road, got out and started doing some work, and ended up finding a dead body with no head or hands. Freshly dumped as it wasn't decayed. They had to go back the same direction as the van. Luckily, they never crossed paths. They reported it to the RCMP and was told it was most likely biker gang-related hit. I live a lot of my life in seclusion, though I spend a lot of time in the city as well. I tend to take the creepiest things with me to my home, and I've amassed a great collection of skulls and bones, and various other items of morbidity, a few things I've experienced that might be of interest. Deep in the woods I find a hole dug about three feet down. Around it someone had constructed a rudimentary tip-eye out of shipping pallets, reinforced with greased rope and branches. A tarp was tangled over it, blown up by the wind. I peered in and found it recently lived in, freshly stirred dirt at the bottom. I lit the floor of the place with a flashlight and found a collection of undergarments belonging to young girls, all bright colors and cartoon characters, buried beneath a scree of dirt, rocks, and leaves. A duffel bag of loot was tucked in the back, mostly vitamin packets and detritus. Empty liquor bottles. A man's bottoming out point, miles from civilization. The other place was near the grain silos, repurposed by the Salvation Army as an apartment complex for vagrants and mental patients. There was an old oil company, long abandoned and hollowed out, just over a set of train tracks and through a thicket of shrub grass. It was midnight or later, and I was alone. Being closer to civilization, I did not want to attract attention. I made my way in the dark starlight and moonlight offered me a little guidance, though I was mostly beneath an overpass. I heard a rustling in the distance. I was too far in. City for this to be a deer, and it sounded bigger than a turkey, which can be found basically anywhere. I had my knife out, and I stepped closer to the origin of the sound. I heard a groaning, a muttering, gurgling sound, a growling. It was growing louder, and I was starting to make out syllables, not speech per se, not words, but differentiated syllables. Just as the growling reached its zenith, I looked up and saw a man on a bike pedaling down the sidewalk on the overpass above me. He had headphones on, and he was listening to death metal and growling along with the vocals. I was overcome with relief, 
but also a wash with dread, because now I know why people don't talk to me when I'm on campus, because I do that exact same thing. I've also found some really strange signs out in the middle of nowhere. From memory, I can say that my two favorites are Uncle Bart will of you up, and outside an old slaughterhouse in block-printed scrawl. Cattle operation trailer closed. Please do not dump. You will be seen. I'm sure I can think of more if anyone is interested. I'm a weird dude. I've lived in Lake Charles, born and raised, but in 2004 I moved to Alaska to be a youth pastor for a church. I was living in Seward and was invited to come and speak at a church in Fairbanks. About a nine hour drive. I'm from the south, not used to. I got there in January. This was in February. I took out on this trip by myself and had been given tips. This is where you want to stop. This is where you don't want to stop. Gas is real expensive here. Things like that. So I got out just north of Anchorage. North of Wasilla, up in that part of the country. There are people who have said that you stop and pick up hitchhikers. It's just kind of a thing. You don't really do it in Louisiana. Here it's life and death. If you see somebody on the road, you stop. So I saw a man walking north on the road and I pulled over. He got in the truck and I remember, just remember distinctly, he had a bit of a body odor smell. He smelled like a campfire. He was unshaven. His name, he told me, was Alex. He spoke with a Russian accent and he said he was a mountain climber and he said his favorite place on earth was the top of Mount Everest and that he was in Alaska to climb Mount McKinley. So he was on his way to Denali Park. He rode with me in the car for about two and a half hours asking me about why I was there. About my calling and feel on my life, those types of things with me. He gave me tips about driving on the ice, told me not to do things that would have caused error. We came to a town called Trapper Creek. I don't know if you are familiar with it. I was not going to get gas there. It was one of the places I was told not to get gas there because the prices will kill you there, he said. You'll want to stop here because the weather is too bad. Denali is going to be closed, and so I said okay. He had been in the car for two and a half hours. We talked extensively about Everest and his plan to see the top of Mount McKinley. Well, we stopped. I got out, started fueling the car. He grabbed his small backpack that he had and walked into. I saw him walk into the gas station. The little junction station had a little cafe in it. He walked through the doors. When I finished filling up, I went in to use the restroom, pay in, grab a bite. I asked the clerk, I said, Where's the man that just walked in? And she looked at me and said, You're the only one that has been here for hours. I said, No. A man just walked through these doors. We spent 20 minutes walking around the back of the building. We followed the tracks, the two sets of tracks, back to the truck. He was nowhere to be found. There was icy wetness where he had been sitting in the truck. The truck still smelled like him so at that point. I've chalked it up to. Was it a ghost or was it an angel? I don't know what. I wouldn't have had enough gas. And when I got to Denali, that gas station was indeed closed. Well, I've spent many years on the ocean, sailed from SF, CIA, to Sydney, Australia, on a 30-feet sailboat. I've seen plenty of amazing and intense things, like storms, lightning hitting the water, supermassive pods of dolphins, giant whales surfacing next to and following the boat in the middle of the night, etc. But by far the strangest, most perplexing thing I've seen is what I call the chessboard. Calm seas, middle of the night. I'm on watch, looking out on the water, and I start to notice some flashing happening around the boat. Now the water was very bioluminescent, and I was used to certain amount of organic-type shapes, trails, etc., which can be spooky enough when a huge fish or mammal swims towards your tiny boat and swims under at the last second, then turns around and does it again. But this was totally different. 
different color of light, much whiter and brighter, and the shapes were very square, geometrical, seemed to be very near the surface. Anyhow, started off with three or four squares. Each square was, I'd say, twelve by twelve. Then more and more appeared, forming into a chessboard-type pattern. The chessboard stretched out as far as I could see in the night. They'd all come on for a while, then alternate lit squares, change into random patterns like they were communicating. This went on for ten minutes, then everything went dark at the same time. I would so love to know what that was. In 1999, I was working at a state park in Pennsylvania and got to know the back areas of it pretty well, the areas most tourists do not get to see. Approximately one mile from the park on a long all-dirt road was a large clearing in the woods, which was cleared for power lines and gas well used. Once you got to that spot, you would have to walk over a long hill until you came to an old abandoned trail. If you followed this trail, it would take you deep into the forest. Once day, I followed it and found that it led to an old dilapidated cabin, not on the park cabin records, and it looked like it hadn't been used for many decades. Even though it was daylight, I still got this creepy feeling like I shouldn't be there and worse that something was watching every move I made. A few weeks later, while I was off, duty, two of my friends and myself were just out driving around enjoying the summer night, and since I knew all the back roads, I was taking them on kind of a tour. Note, none of these roads are off limits or secret, so I wasn't breaking any rules. Other than that mysterious cabin, the park hasn't any secrets. About 11 p.m. I came to that familiar clearing and I mentioned something about the old cabin. Being a brave soul, I talked them into letting me show them the cabin. So I grabbed my flashlight and we took off down the hill and onto the path that led to the cabin. I took the lead and we walked halfway when all of a sudden my light flashed on something on the right side of the path. Almost immediately I stopped and said, Did you just see that? To which they responded, See what? As I panned the light back to the right side of the road, I said, That! They're standing by a tree. It was a creature only seen in sci-fi movies. It had a grayish olive color skin and very thin in its extremities. The calves and forearm muscles were very large as well was the chest. The face was the strangest thing since it had the typical alien gray head shape, but there was no mouth. It had a nose that was long and thin, but not longer than its chin. The eyes had a reddish gleam in the light, but not the size of most reported aliens. Very small, even by human standard. I hate to make this reference for fear of questioning my sanity, but my best description was like what the goons looked like in the Popeye cartoon. It leaning oddly against the tree like if you were leaning on an armchair by only one arm, to make another TV show reference, but like the Fonz would lean on the jukebox on happy days, minus the legs being crossed. Immediately everyone wanted to leave, but as we turned, my flashlight went out. My friends told me to quit messing with them and turn the light back, onto which I informed them that I wasn't messing with them, and to keep moving now that I was at the back of the group. I frantically continued to beat on my flashlight, trying to get it to work again. As soon as it came back on, I immediately swiveled back around to shine it behind us. The creature had moved up significantly and now was on the left side. We hurried to the clearing and once we got back up the hill and to the main dirt road, things got worse. Out of woods we had just come through was this high-pitched, blood-curdling, screeching noise, which after it started... Others started to answer back from the other side of the clearing. The fact that I was a park ranger had been in the woods all my life and had my degree from Penn State in wildlife. Management means I've heard a lot of noises in the wild, but have never heard that sound before. I know it wasn't any kind of owl or bobcat, bear, bird, porcupine. You get the drift. Once I told my dad about the encounter, he told me, it could have been the chupacabras, which I had never heard of before, and as far as aliens go, never believed in it until recently. 
months went by without incident. Other than not being able to shake that I'm watching you feeling, I was to the point of feeling like I was being stalked. One night I went to get something from my truck when I looked into the woods and saw those reddish glowing eyes staring at me in the shadows. I immediately ran into the house and grabbed my biggest knife. I am not a gun guy, to which my dad asked me what I was doing. I told him I was tired of feeling stalked and was going to face this thing. He told me he was coming with me, but all along I knew he never truly believed me or my encounter. When we got outside, he nonchalantly asked, Okay, where did you see this thing? And I pointed to the spot to which he directed his flashlight. Much to his disbelief, there it was, and as soon as the light hit, it tore off deep into the woods. My dad, an ex-Marine who served proudly during Vietnam, yelled at me to get back into the house with fear. Fear in his voice. To this day, it still creeps me out, telling this encounter and my handshake, even while typing while recalling it all. I am now in my thirties with a wife and kids, but even now, when I go outside at night, I still feel watched to the point that when I get a real strong feeling, my wife won't let me leave the house without her. Just as a side note. For the first five years of our relationship, she too would catch sight of this creature but mostly as it was going into the shadows. As a further note, if anyone is questioning it, there were no drugs or alcohol or any other substance involved during this or any other encounter I have had. Former submarine Sonomarn here. No windows, so it falls outside the creepy things I've seen requisite. More of a creepy thing we heard. I was stationed on the west coast. Whenever we would transit near a particular Californian city, within a specific area, we would hear over the headphones the something that started off sounding like a woman screaming and ended sounding like bullfrogs on a hot summer night. None of the sonar techs up through our chief knew what to make of it. We chalked it up to just being a merfrog and carried on. It was around 4 a.m. and I had finished a movie on the couch with my husband, but he fell asleep. Once it ended, I went to the door to have a cigarette before bed. We lived in a basement apartment and our door was ground level at the rear of the house facing south with a small backyard about 15, 20 feet deep with three large trees lining the edge, backing onto bush and swamp. When I opened our big door and looked out the screen door, which had glass at the top and a screen at the bottom. I typically open the screen door a bit and set the bar to hold it and stick half of my body outside to have a cigarette. As soon as I set the bar and looked up, I immediately noticed three large glowing lights hovering at the very top of those three trees. Two white ones were in the two left trees and one red, one in the tree on the right. I was taken off guard a bit and figured it was a reflection from the stove or microwave, so I concluded that if I moved or bucked the light, the light would go away. I ran into my bedroom, which had a huge picture window right next to the door I was poking out of. If it was truly a reflection, I'd see nothing in a dark room. So I peeked out of the blinds, and there they were. I was blown away, so I ran back out into the living room and looked again. For some reason, I cannot understand why I didn't wake my husband to show him. It was like I was in a state of shock, or like everything around me froze, and I forgot about him. This time, when I looked out the door, it was still open a little bit. I stuck my head out, and all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming feeling of being exposed, and just as I jumped to shut the door, in fear I could make out multiple beings walking around in the backyard, with two of them coming, towards me, the door. But the way they moved was strange, like in one place, one second, then another the next. I freaked and slammed both doors shut and ran to grab my video camera and ran into my bedroom to record. When I looked out, I could still see them. It scared me so much I couldn't handle the thought of opening the blinds, so I set my camera up and stuck it in the blinds. 
By this time, it was probably around 4.35 a.m., and I was wide awake in a state of panic in a half-seated position at the edge of the middle of my bed. The bed was against the wall with a large picture window spanning the entire bed, holding the camera in the blinds recording and taking the odd. Terrifying peak when all of a sudden I'm waking up and it's sunny out. Only then I realized I was sitting or half falling off the end of my bed very awkwardly and the camera was on top of my dresser. I grabbed it immediately to review the footage. The first two playbacks were nothing, and the third was only 30 seconds of blackness. I was devastated. Then it was like reality snapped back in, and I looked up, and it was 7.30 in the morning. For your information, I cannot just fall asleep sitting up or not in a bed laying down comfortably, so the odds that I just passed out are highly unfavorable because it has not happened since. I barreled out of the room to tell my husband and I couldn't speak fast enough. I was in a total moment of panic and anxiety. The first thing he asked is why I did not wake him and to this day, I'm so mad. I didn't, but I can't figure out why. I remember looking right at him, laying there sleeping when I first saw the objects. Then it was like time around me was frozen. I was still in real time. Before that experience, my husband and our, at the time, three-years-old daughter would see strange lights moving erratically, always flashing white and red in inconsistent patterns. We live under a flight path and are used to seeing planes and small water planes or helicopters pass over, but these flew much differently and very low, also typically sighted and remained in the same area. After the experience, the sightings got more intense. Walking the dog, I would spot a large light or craft that would seem to stalk me. My husband would often notice lights following him while driving home from work. I'd go out into my driveway to see the stars with my daughter and end up always having a sighting. One night, I put out the garbage in a red light about twice the size of a yoga ball hovering above the middle of the road. Very low. I looked directly at it and yelled, go away, quite a few times and returned inside. After that, we would rarely see them and were never stalked again. Though I do fear and am almost certain we are still visited, since over the past year I've had a few very strange, vivid dreams that almost seem like memories of being on board a craft with my husband. Tons of other humans gathered in a large room with multiple entities, some larger arms and robes at the front watching and others walking around. One female entity comes over and takes my husband by the hand and escorted him to a private room to briefly cover it. I am aware there are no answers to these strange events, but I'm more concerned about finding out if there were any related sightings or experiences in my area around that time, and about my story being documented for research, etc. I almost forgot to mention the area of trees that the UFOs were hovering in seemed to be affected, as the top of the trees died exactly within the top of it. This occurred in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.